Yes, Ms Earl. Commissioner, we turn now to the second part of these hearings in which we shift our focus to financial services entities that provide general insurance products. Most of the insurance products that Australians deal with on a regular basis, including home, car and travel insurance, are forms of general insurance. As we mentioned in our opening statement last Monday, in the course of this second week of hearings, we will examine issues relating to the way general insurance products are sold, how general insurance products are designed, and how claims are handled under general insurance policies. In examining that last issue, the handling of claims under general insurance policies, we will examine the case studies that were deferred from the fourth round of hearings, which concern the experiences of people who have made claims under home insurance policies following natural disasters. Then at the end of this week, we'll draw together some of the themes explored in both weeks of the hearings and consider the regulation of the insurance industry as a whole. In our opening statement last Monday, we explained how the general insurance industry is regulated and we summarise the acknowledgements of misconduct and conduct that fell below community standards and expectations made by general insurance companies. In this brief further statement, we will provide an overview of the general insurance industry based in part on data that certain general insurance companies have provided to the Commission. We will then summarise what consumers and consumer advocates have told the Commission about their experiences with general insurance. We will also explain what ASIC, the Financial Ombudsman Service and the General Insurance Code Governance Committee have told the Commission about their compliance roles in relation to general insurance. We'll then briefly introduce the case studies to be explored in this part of the hearings. We begin with an overview of the general insurance industry. There are many different types of insurance that are classified as general insurance. These include motor vehicle insurance, home insurance, contents insurance, and insurance for other types of personal property, strata insurance, travel insurance, pet insurance, various types of statutory insurance, including compulsory third-party motor vehicle insurance, various types of add-on insurance, including gap insurance, tyre and rim insurance, and the general insurance component of consumer credit insurance, professional indemnity insurance, other types of liability insurance, and business interruption insurance. Some types of general insurance are directed towards businesses, and others are sold to consumers. In these hearings, we'll focus on general insurance products that are sold to consumers, in particular, home insurance, travel insurance, and add-on insurance. In the last financial year, the top five consumer-oriented general insurers in Australia by total gross earned premium were AAI, which trades as Suncorp Insurance, Insurance Australia Limited, which is part of the Insurance Australia Group, or IAG, QBE Insurance, Allianz, and Insurance Manufacturers of Australia, which is a joint venture between IAG and RC RACV. In preparation for this round of hearings, the Commission sought witness statements from AAI, IAG, QBE, Allianz, and UE and from the three major banks that have general insurance businesses, CBA, ANZ and Westpac. In those statements, we asked the insurers to tell the Commission about how they design general insurance products, how they sell and promote general insurance products, how they handle claims under general insurance policies, and how they remunerate the personnel involved in selling general insurance products and handling general insurance claims. At the end of this opening statement, we'll tender those statements. We note that the different insurers recorded or accounted for the information that the Commission asked about in different ways. This means that there were differences in the ways that the sales of policies and the handling of claims in respect of those policies were reported across the different statements. The relevant differences are explained in detail in the insurer's statements. 
We deal first with what those statements indicated about how Australians buy general insurance. We asked the eight general insurance companies about the ways they sell and promote their products. In Australia, general insurance products are sold in two ways. Directly to the customer by the insurer, including online, by telephone or face-to-face, -face, such as in branches operated by the insurer, or through an intermediary, including a financial institution, a car dealer, an underwriting agency, or an insurance broker. Where general insurance is sold directly to the customer or through an intermediary other than an insurance broker, it is generally sold with no financial advice or with general advice only. That is, with advice that does not take into account the personal circumstances of the customer. When general insurance is sold through an insurance broker, it is generally sold with personal financial advice. We have referred in previous rounds of hearings and last week in respect of life insurance to the prohibitions on conflicted remuneration contained in part seven of the Corporations Act. General insurance is, and always has been, excluded from the conflicted remuneration provisions of part seven. This means that there is no limit on the amount that general insurance companies can pay in commissions in relation to the sale of general insurance products. As you'll hear in the course of this week, the exclusion of general insurance from the ban on conflicted remuneration has led to what ASIC has termed reverse competition in relation to the sale of add-on insurance products through intermediaries like car dealers, where insurers compete on the price paid to car dealers in commissions to buy access to distribution channels instead of competing on price or value of products offered to consumers. In the financial years from 2013 to 15, ASIC found that insurers paid more than $600 million in upfront commissions to car yard intermediaries for the sale of add-on insurance products. In the same period, the insurers collected $1.6 billion in premiums from those products and paid out only $144 million in claims. These products are generally sold with no final financial advice or general advice only. Separately to monetary benefits provided to intermediaries such as car dealers, who generally don't provide personal advice, we asked the eight general insurance companies to provide information about monetary benefits that they provide to Australian financial services licence holders or authorised representatives of AFSL holders in circumstances where an employee or authorised representative of the entity might be expected to provide personal financial advice in relation to general insurance products. Examples of the types of monetary benefits provided include standard commissions, calculated as a percentage of insurance premiums written, as well as profit share payments, additional commissions, and volume-based incentives. In the period from the 1st of July 2013 to the 30th of June this year, Allianz told the Commission that it paid more than $240 million in commissions to entities that might be expected to provide financial advice in relation to general insurance products. IAG told the Commission that it paid more than $500 million in commissions to these entities. QBE told the Commission that it paid more than $800 million in commission to these entities. Those figures are in addition to the amounts paid in commission to intermediaries who sold general insurance products with no advice or general advice only. We turn to who within the eight insurers Australians tended to buy general insurance from. In relation to motor vehicle insurance and home and contents insurance, IAG and AAI sold significantly more policies than the other insurers in the last financial year. They also received the highest amount of premiums for those policies last year. In relation to travel insurance, 
only four of the insurers who provided witness statements reported having sold travel insurance during the last financial year. Of those, Allianz and QBE sold the most travel insurance policies and received the most premiums for those policies. QBE announced its decision to exit the travel insurance market in August this year. We turn to the handling of claims in the general insurance industry. The insurers told the Commission that a person who makes a claim under a general insurance policy usually lodges that claim via a telephone call or online, setting out certain information about the claim. Once the relevant information has been gathered by the insurer about the claim, the claim is assessed against the policy terms. There are many different reasons why an insurer might decide to deny a general insurance claim. We ask the general insurers to provide us with information about the most common reasons why they denied general insurance claims in respect of each of the types of product. These reasons included for motor vehicle insurance claims, because a specific exclusion in the wording of the policy prevented the claim being covered, such as where the claimed damage was found to result from lack of maintenance rather than being caused by an accident, because of non-disclosure by the claimant at the time of purchasing the policy, or because the customer did not meet a condition of the policy which related to the specific circumstances of the claim. For home and contents insurance claims, claims were commonly denied because there was no coverage for the particular claimed event or item under the policy, or because a specific exclusion or exception in the wording of the policy prevented the claim from being covered, such as where the damage was found to be caused by wear and tear rather than by the claimed event. For travel insurance claims, claims were commonly denied because there was no coverage for the claimed event or item under the policy, because a specific exclusion or exception in the policy prevented the claim being covered, or because the customer was unable to prove loss or ownership of the claimed item. Could we please show document RCD 0026-0003 triple zero one. Now, the chart on the left shows the percentage of declined claims as a proportion of all claims received by the eight insurers for each policy type for the last financial year. And as we can see from that chart, claims made under travel insurance policies are declined the most frequently with more than one in every 10 claims declined. Motor vehicle claims and home and contents claims were declined in full at a rate of 0.27% and 5.77% respectively. The chart on the right shows the average or mean claim resolution time by policy type, being the number of calendar days that elapse between the date of receipt of the claim form by the insurer and the date on which the claim was closed by the insurer. We focused on the date on which the claim was closed for two reasons. First, because several of the insurers told us their systems did not record the decision date for the claim. And second, because a decision about the claim may have been made within days of receipt, but the time taken to resolve the claim was significantly longer. As we'll see in the case studies in relation to natural disasters later this week, many of the problems associated with the handling of general insurance claims can arise after a decision about the claim has been made. As we can see from the chart on the right, claims are closed most quickly in relation to travel insurance claims, averaging approximately 41.18 days after receipt of the claim. Claims made under motor vehicle and home and contents policies take significantly longer to resolve and are closed at approximately 64 and 65 days respectively. Commissioner, I tender this document. Chart showing percentage claims declined by product type and days to resolve claims for period 1 July 17 to 30 June 18 RCD 
0026003001, Exhibit 6.250. And I tender the witness statements that set out the information I've referred to. In relation to AAI, I tender the witness statement of Gary Dransfield, dated the 31st of August 2018. Exhibit 6.251. In relation to Alliance, I tender the witness statement of Michael Winter, dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.252. And the witness statement of David Krowitz, dated 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.253. In relation to IAG, I tender the witness statement of Mark Milliner, dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.254. In relation to CBA, I tender the witness statement of Miles Soudan, <coughs> dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.255. The witness statement of Sinead Taylor, dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.256. And the witness statement of Gareth Russell, dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.257. In relation to QBE, I tender the witness statement of Christopher Kalori dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.258. In relation to ANZ, I tender the witness statement of David Roberts, dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.259. In relation to Westpac, I tender the witness statement of Susan Horton, dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.260. And in relation to UE, I tender the witness statement of Bert Backer, dated the 30th of August 2018. Exhibit 6.261. We turn to what the Commission has heard from consumers, consumer representatives, the Financial Ombudsman Service and the General Insurance Code Compliance Committee about consumer experiences in relation to general insurance. Of the 8,977 public submissions received by the Commission to the 14th of September this year, 620 were identified as relating to general insurance. Of these, the three most common types of general insurance <coughs> policies referred to were home and contents insurance, car insurance and travel insurance. The most common issues raised in the public submissions concerned claims handling processes. Many submissions referred to delays in handling insurance claims and refusals to pay out on insurance policies. A number of submissions emphasised the impact that ongoing delays in processing claims and undertaking repair work had on the consumer, particularly where the repairs affected their ability to live in their home. There were also a number of submissions relating to the third parties engaged to undertake repairs under an insurance policy. A number of submissions complained of the selective use by insurers of assessors or reports from professionals. Concerns were also raised about insurers requiring that particular service providers be engaged to undertake repairs, which in some cases extended delays or affected the quality of the repairs. A number of the public submissions related to the handling of insurance claims following natural disasters. Many of these submissions raise similar claims handling concerns. In some cases, the delays in claims handling meant that individuals had to move into temporary or alternative accommodation for long periods of time following a natural disaster. In a number of cases, independent structural engineering reports obtained by the customer contradicted the assessment relied on by the insurer. Some submissions also referred to pressure from insurers for policyholders to accept cash settlement payments, which did not reflect the true cost of the damage or were substantially below the claim amount and which left organisation of repairs within the settlement amount to the consumer. The Commission also received a number of submissions relating to travel insurance. The most common concerns in relation to travel insurance related to the treatment of pre-existing conditions, including charging high premiums to cover such conditions, 
or a denial of claims on this basis. The Commission also received submissions from consumer organisations and met with them in preparation for the hearings. We make the following observations about the concerns that they raised. First, a number of the bodies raised concerns in relation to the disclosure of policy terms. Choice noted that long and complex terms and conditions in the product disclosure statements for insurance policies often result in consumers facing loopholes or exceptions that mean they don't receive the support that they expected from their insurance policy when they make a claim. Choice pointed to non-standard definitions as one contributor to a lack of understanding on the part of consumers about what they are covered for. The Financial Rights Legal Centre told the Commission that it commonly hears consumers complaining that they have been caught by the fine print of their insurance policies. It considers that disclosure documents are overly complex, long and ineffective in empowering consumers to make informed choices at the point of sale and that rather than promoting consumer understanding, disclosures allow insurers to manage their liability and reduce claims outcomes. Second, a number of consumer organisations raised concerns with sales practices for general insurance. The Financial Rights Legal Centre and the Consumer Action Law Centre both told the Commission that general insurance sold under a no advice or general advice model results in the widespread selling of insurance that is unsuitable for the people buying it. Consumer Action considers that this leads to poor outcomes for consumers who are provided with insufficient or inadequate information to inform their decision or to engage with the complexities of the products. The Financial Rights Legal Centre also told the Commission that this model leads to significant underinsurance as consumers are not fully informed about the limitations of their cover. Claims handling was also a common concern raised by the consumer bodies. Consumer Action said that many consumers are discouraged from making claims in the first place because of a fear that the claim would lead to an increased premium. It also said that the two-stage internal dispute resolution processes adopted by general insurers can deter people from pursuing legitimate complaints as the complaint process is seen as laborious. A number of consumer organisations raised concerns with the sale of add-on insurance. Insurance sold under these models is generally sold through distributors such as banks, car dealerships, <coughs> retailers and airlines who generally receive commissions and other incentives from insurers. Consumer Action told the Commission that these products are often expensive compared to insurance brought, bought directly from an insurer and that they are often low value. The Financial Rights Legal Centre also pointed to the selling practices for these products, including keeping consumers captive until after a sales pitch is completed, using the cooling off period as a selling point, deliberately masking the cost of insurance in loan payments, and serious deficiencies in scripts used for sale of consumer credit insurance products. Add-on insurance sold through car yards will be the subject of a case study this week. The Commission has also heard from representatives of bodies that assist consumers in dealing with insurance companies in the wake of natural disasters and severe weather events. These have included representatives of legal aid bodies from a number of states, as well as the Financial Rights Legal Centre. Later this week, we will summarise statements we received from Legal Aid New South Wales and Legal Aid Queensland in relation to the experience of their clients in relation to natural disasters. The submission from the Financial Rights Legal Centre raised issues relating to the price of premiums for flood coverage. It expressed concern that events similar to the floods in 2011 are likely to occur again with significant numbers of properties uninsured for flood as a result of customers being unable to afford appropriate cover, being refused cover or opting out of cover without appreciating the full extent of their risk. 
ASIC told the Commission about enforcement action that it has taken in relation to the general insurance industry. ASIC told the Commission that it has taken action on 32 occasions since the 1st of January 2008 that it described as enforcement action against general insurers. The action consisted of the following. First, ASIC issued three sets of infringement notices in respect of misleading advertising of insurance products. The first set, comprising four notices, was issued to RAA Insurance Limited for misleading television advertising about a motor vehicle insurance policy. RAA paid $43,200 in penalties under the four infringement notices. The two remaining sets of infringement notices were issued to AAI. The first set, comprising two notices, related to false or misleading advertising relating to car insurance, for which AAI paid $20,400 in penalties. The second set, comprising four notices, related to false or misleading statements promoting its home building insurance complete replacement cover product, which resulted in the payment of $43,200 in penalties. The conduct that led to this second set of infringement notices to AAI will be the subject of a case study in this week of hearings. Second, ASIC imposed additional conditions on the licence of two insurers, Hallmark Insurance, which is GE Money, and Virginia Surety Company Inc. Third, in 2016, ASIC accepted an enforceable undertaking from ACE Insurance Limited in relation to the misconduct of salespeople who had made misleading statements to consumers and sold unsuitable insurance policies. The enforceable undertaking required ACE to appoint an independent expert to review its compliance systems, implement a remediation plan to compensate affected consumers, and make a donation of $1 million to financial counselling and financial literacy initiatives. Fourth, ASIC requested remedial action from general insurers on 26 occasions, which included 12 customer remediation programs. We provide some examples of those programs. In 2016, following concerns raised by ASIC, Optus Insurance Services agreed to refund approximately $2.4 million to around 175,000 Optus Mobile customers for its failure to provide customers with product disclosure statements and financial services <coughs> guides. Five of the customer remediation programs relate to add-on insurance products sold through car dealerships. In the case of each insurer, the add-on insurance products being remediated offered little or no benefit or were of low or no value. The five insurers were Virginia Surety Company Inc, who is to refund over $330,000 to more than 500 consumers, QBE, who will refund up to $15.9 million to more than 35,000 consumers, Swan Insurance, a subsidiary of IAG, who will re offer to refund $39 million to 67,960 consumers. Allianz, who will refund $45.6 million to 68,000 customers. And Suncorp, who will refund $17.2 million to 41,428 customers. Collectively, the amounts being remediated for the sale of add-on insurance through car dealerships are in excess of $118 million. As we've already mentioned, add-on insurance sold through car dealerships will be the subject of a case study this week. We turn to what the Financial Ombudsman Service told the Commission about its role in handling disputes related to general insurance. FOS reported an increase in the number of general insurance disputes it received in the 2016 to 17 year, up by 2,612 disputes on the previous year, 
or approximately 38 per cent. FOS accepted 8,756 general insurance disputes in 2016 to 17, accounting for approximately 35 per cent of all disputes accepted by FOS. FOS reported that the increase in general insurance disputes has been due to a continuation of industry specific issues, including higher claim numbers, organisational changes, and the impact of tropical cyclone Debbie. FOS told the Commission that the periods with the highest number of accepted disputes have been linked to the occurrence of natural disasters, particularly during 2010 and 2011. The main issue in these disputes was confusion over the extent of cover due to the various definitions of flood and storm. We turn to the Code Governance Committee. The Code Governance Committee, or CGC, is an independent body that monitors and enforces insurers' compliance with the General Industry Code of Practice. It's comprised of a consumer representative, an industry representative and an independent chair. The CGC outsources its day-to-day -day code compliance monitoring work to the FOS code compliance team. The CGC reported that subscribers' data revealed increased claims activity in 2016 to 17. This was attributed in part to the greater impact of catastrophes in that year. Several code subscribers reported to the CGC that severe and extreme weather events contributed to growth in both claims and declined claims, including in relation to home insurance. Although the Insurance Council of Australia declared only five catastrophes in 2016 to 17, the same number as in the previous year, the CGC reported that their impact was far greater as a result, consumers lodged around 182,565 catastrophe-related claims in 2016 to 17, a sharp increase from the approximately 41,000 claims the previous year. Total estimated losses were approximately $2.76 billion. Finally, Commissioner, we make some brief observations about the case studies which will be examined for the remainder of these hearings. The issues to be explored this week include internal compliance processes for insurers, the sale of add-on insurance products and issues associated with claims under home insurance policies following natural disasters. The first case study concerns incorrect and misleading statements made by Allianz in relation to its travel insurance products and the compliance processes within Allianz. These issues will be explored through two witnesses, Mr Michael Winter, the Chief General Manager of Retail Distribution, and Ms Laurie Callaghan, the Chief Risk Officer. The second case study will consider the sale of add-on insurance products the Commission will hear from Mr Benjamin Bessel from Insurance Australia Group, or IAG, uh, about the provision of add-on insurance products sold through car dealerships. The next three case studies all relate to the conduct of insurers in handling claims made under home insurance policies after natural disasters. The first also relates to the conduct of AAI in advertising its home insurance policies. Issues with that conduct came to light as part of an investigation into Suncorp's handling of insurance claims arising from the bushfires near Wye River in Victoria in 2015. The Commission will hear evidence in this case study from Mr Gary Dransfield, the Chief Executive Officer Insurance for the Suncorp Group. The second of these case studies relates to the conduct of UI in connection with insurance claims arising from damage to homes caused by two natural disasters, Tropical Cyclone Debbie, which hit Queensland in March 2017, and the severe hailstorm that struck Broken Hill in November 2016. The Commission will hear evidence from two consumers who made claims with UI following damage to their homes and from Mr Jason Storey, the Chief Operating Officer, Claim Services at UWE. 
The third of these case studies relates to the conduct of AAI in connection with an insurance claim arising from damage to a home caused by flooding in the Hunter Valley in April 2015. The Commission will hear evidence from a consumer and will hear further evidence from Mr Dransfield, the Chief Executive Officer Insurance for the Suncorp Group. The final issue that we will consider in this sixth round of hearings is the regulation of the insurance industry. The Commission will hear evidence from the peak representative bodies for general and life insurers, from Mr Robert Whelan, CEO of the Insurance Council of Australia, and Ms Sally Lone, CEO of the Financial Services Council. Commissioner, that concludes the opening remarks in relation to the general insurance part of these hearings. Uh, the first witness is Michael Winter of Allianz. Yes. Mr Winter, would you be good enough to come into the witness box? And just before you sit down, can I ask you whether you prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An oath, please. Say the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Winter. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Walker. Mr. Winter, is your full name Michael Dean Winter? Yes. And is your business address 2 Margaret Street, Sydney? Yes. Is your current position Chief General Manager of Retail Distribution of Allianz Australia Limited? Yes. And you're here to give evidence in response to a summons issued to you, is that correct? Yes. Do you have the summons with you? Uh, I do, yes. I tend to that. Exhibit 6.262, the summons to Mr Winter. Mr Winter, in respect of rubric 6-63, you've made a statement, is that correct? Yes. And is that statement dated 24 August 2018? Yes. And are the contents of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, Commissioner, I attended that statement and the exhibit accompanying the statement. A statement of Mr Winter in relation to rubric 6-63 of 24 August 18, together with its exhibits, becomes Exhibit 6.263. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Ms. Orr. Mr. Winter, you've been the Chief General Manager of Retail Distribution for Allianz Australia Limited since September 2014. Yes. Uh, and Allianz Australia Limited owns Allianz Australia Insurance Limited. Yes. And that company, Allianz Australia Insurance Limited, issues general insurance products. Yes. Uh, including home insurance. Yes. Motor vehicle insurance. Yes. Travel insurance. Yes. Now you're responsible for the division of Allianz's insurance business, which distributes insurance products through call centres, financial institutions and motor dealers. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and online? Yes. And you've worked in various roles at Allianz since 2001? Yes. You've been put forward by Allianz to give evidence about its travel insurance? Yes. Uh, and about incorrect and misleading content on Allianz's website? Yes. Before I come to that incorrect and misleading content, uh, I want to take a bit of time to understand the way that Allianz sells travel insurance. Allianz has a significant share of the market for travel insurance in Australia. Yes. Uh, it had 24% of that market in 2013 to 14, you tell us in paragraph 16 of your statement. Yes. Uh, and you estimate that it had 25% of that market in 2017 to 18. Yes. And over the last five years, the number of travel insurance policies that Allianz has sold has decreased. Yes. Uh, from about 1.5 million policies in the 2014 financial year to about 770,000 policies in the 2018 financial year. Yes. But over that same period, the amounts of premiums paid for travel insurance policies issued by Allianz has increased. Yes. From about 189 million to about 257 million. 
Yes. Why is that, Mr Winter? Madam, all the nature of the, all the type of product changed during that period. So in 2015-16, um, uh, there's a product uh, that is embedded in a credit card um, supplied by banks. So they're done as a master policy, um, but they cover multiple consumers. So you'll, you'll see in the data the number of policies whilst it, under the, that particular line um, is small. It's covering a, a large number of customers through the credit card base. Mm -hmm. So the premiums have in increased because uh, you have group credit card business with Correct. two financial institutions. Is that right? There were, to be clear, there were two new um, financial institutions Thank during you. that time. But Thank there you. are, um, I think there are uh, three to four in total. I see. So that skews uh, the number of policies uh, because it's a single group policy that covers all of the people who have travel insurance under their credit cards with that financial institution. Is that right? Yes. Uh, now, do you agree that it's becoming increasingly common for people to access travel insurance through their credit cards? Yes. Uh, and is the travel insurance that's available through a credit card the same as the travel insurance that's available through other channels? No. Uh, what's different about it? Uh, typically it'll provide um, a level of cover uh, that would be less than, uh, it would be available if it was a fully underwritten product. So by that I mean uh, with it being automatically included, it's not rated for somebody's individual circumstances. So in, in that effect, the cover is um, uh, typically more of an essential or basic cover than what might be available under a personal product. Okay, so the level of cover tends to be less under insurance, travel insurance held under credit cards? Yes, that's is my that right? understanding. And does credit card travel insurance usually also exclude cover for pre-existing medical conditions? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. So the coverage that a consumer gets under their travel insurance policy under their credit card is likely to be inferior to the travel insurance cover that they could get through another means, not as a group credit card policy? Typically, yes. Um, Madam I would like to point out in one arrangement there is a facility for customers to apply for pre-existing condition cover. I see. With one of the financial institutions that you provide travel insurance through? Yes. Okay. Now, apart from group travel insurance policies sold to the financial institutions uh, to provide to customers through credit cards, what are the other ways that Allianz sells travel insurance? Um, on a direct basis through the Allianz website and um, through AWP, which is an underwriting agency through their direct relationships, uh, through travel agents, um, and through uh, what's known as an integrated pathway, where the travel cover will be included in the purchase path of another, um, like if, if someone's buying travel online, uh, the travel insurance will be included as part of that purchase path. We refer to it in, our, in, the, in my witness statement as integrated. So that's a purchase path that consumers can use when they go to a website, for example, of an airline, is that right? Yes. Or a website uh, of a travel agency? Yes. Okay. Uh, and does Allianz also sell travel insurance uh, directly through banks and credit unions? Uh, yes. And also through mortgage brokers? Uh, yes. Now, you referred to AWP in that answer uh, as an underwriting agency. Can you explain what you mean by an underwriting agency? So, uh, AWP has authority under our licence uh, with respect to travel insurance to operate um, and issue travel. Uh, so, in that respect, they um, manage pricing and claims uh, directly. They manage pricing and claims directly mm -hmm. yes. on behalf of Allianz? Yes. 
Now, AWP trades under the brand Allianz Worldwide Partners, is that right? Yes. And Allianz doesn't own AWP, is that right? Yes. But AWP and Allianz are both ultimately owned by a German company called Allianz SE. Yes. Um, now, the relationship between Allianz and AWP is governed by an underwriting agency agreement. Is that right? Yes. And the current version of that agreement was entered into in July this year? Yes. And you've exhibited that agreement to your statement. Uh, before that, <coughs> the relationship was governed by uh, a similar agreement that was entered into in December 2010. Yes. Uh, now, you've also exhibited that agreement to your statement, the earlier agreement. Yes. Now, I, I want to understand the relationship between the two companies, Allianz and AWP, in a bit more detail. And because most of the events that I want to ask you about happened before July of this year, I want to take you to the December 2010 version of the agreement between Allianz and AWP. Do you understand? Yes. Uh, and that's exhibit two to your witness statement, ALZ 0000770828. Now, if we turn to 0830 within this document, we see that it's an agreement between Allianz and a company called ETI Australia Proprietary Limited. You see that, Mr Winter? Yes. Now, ETI later changed its name to AGA Assistance Australia Proprietary Limited. Yes. Uh, and AGA Assistance Australia Proprietary Limited changed its name to AWP. Yes. So, ETA... AGA and AWP are all the same company. ETI, AWP... I'm and sorry, AGA. ETI. Thank yes. you. My acronym's right. ETI, AGA and AWP are all the same company, which started being known as ETI and is now known as AWP. Yes. So when we see references in these documents, I'm just going to refer to AWP, even when there's a reference to... Uh, ETI or AGA. Yes. Is that clear? Um, now, we can see from the recitals in this agreement that both Allianz and AWP hold Australian financial services licences. Yes. Um, and Allianz is also authorised, we see from the recital, to issue general insurance products. Yes. But AWP is not? No. All right. And if we go to 0835 in this agreement, we see that under clause 4.1, Allianz authorises AWP to develop policy wordings and product disclosure statements. Do you see that? Yes. To determine the premiums for the products? Yes. To market the products? Yes and to administer and coordinate services in relation to the products. Yes. And then at 0836 over the page, we see that under clause 5.4, AWP collects the premiums in respect of the policies. Yes. And it p pays a percentage of those premiums to Allianz. Yes. And at 0837 in clause 5.8, we see that a AWP is authorised uh, to handle all claims under the policies. Yes. Now, this agreement provided, uh, sorry, applied to travel insurance products and some related products. Is that right? Yes. So, Allianz is formally responsible for issuing the travel insurance policies? Yes. But AWP makes decisions about the policy features? Yes. And the policy documentation? Yes. And acts as Allianz's agent in handling applications for the policies? Yes. It markets the policies? 
Yes. And it manages the claims that are made under them. Yes. Now, I want to focus on the sale and marketing of travel insurance policies by AWP. AWP sells travel insurance policies through a number of channels, is that right? Yes. Uh, they sell them through their own website. Yes. Uh, that's different to the Allianz website. Yes. Uh, they also have a call centre. Yes. Uh, and they sell them through travel agencies and financial institutions. Yes. Uh, they sell them through the web websites of third parties, again like airlines or travel sites. Yes. Through credit cards. Yes. And again through insurance brokers. Yes. Now you tell us in your statement that the majority of the travel insurance policies sold by AWP are sold through the websites of third parties like airlines or travel sites. Yes. And Allianz refers to these third parties as partners. Yes. Now, I want to understand the relationship between Allianz, AWP and the partners. There's an agreement between AWP and the partner? Yes. Uh, is there a standard form of agreement? I can't be sure, but I would expect so. And the partner agrees to distribute the travel insurance product through its website? Yes. Uh, and it receives a commission for sales of travel insurance policies? Yes. And AWP manages the relationship with the partner, is that right? That's right and AWP handles the claims and collects the premiums, but the insurance is still formally issued by Allianz. Yes. Um, so just to be clear, a person can buy travel insurance issued by Allianz on Allianz's own website. Yes. On AWP's own website. Yes. And on the <coughs> websites of Allianz's partners, which include airlines and travel, travel entities. Yes. Roughly how many partner websites are there? I don't know the specific numbers, sorry. Can you approximate the numbers, Mr Winter? I believe it's in the order of 70. In the order of 70. And who's responsible for the content on each of those partner websites? AWP. Who proposes what the website will say about Allianz travel insurance policies? AWP. And who's responsible for checking that it complies with the law? Allianz. Now, in your statement, you've distinguished between a website and a purchase path. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain the difference between those two things? Yes. Um, a customer buying travel insurance, the first page they land on on a website, we would refer to that as the landing page. Um, if they then uh, select to buy a policy or get a quote on a policy, we would refer to that as the purchase path because it actually takes them off the, the, the landing page content and begins the, um, the process of buying and quoting travel insurance. Are there as many purchase paths as there are websites? No. <coughs> uh, are there less? Uh, significantly less. And who's responsible for the content on the purchase parts? AWP. Okay. Now, um, it's AWP who proposes what the purchase path will say? Yes. Uh, and who's responsible for checking that the content on the purchase path complies with the law? Allianz. Now, have the arrangements about responsibility for the websites and the purchase paths been the same since 2015? They've changed um, under the new agreement that you mentioned earlier from July of this year. Um, to be clear though, there's always been a process of um, review between both organisations and um, final approval uh, from Allianz for that content on both the website and the purchase path. Now, I want to turn to the issue of the incorrect or misleading content uh, on the Allianz website, uh, which I mentioned earlier. In 2015, Allianz decided to update its website. Yes. You tell us in your statement that it wanted to improve the look and feel of the website. Yes. 
Uh, so most of the content on the website was to remain the same uh, because the update was about changing imagery, introducing navigation bars and changing the layout and design of the website. Yes, but there was also content change as part of that as well. There was some new content that was proposed too. Yes. Now, Alliance has a process for approving new documents, marketing materials and website pages. Yes. And that's called the Document Compliance <coughs> Sign-Off Process or the DCSO process. Yes. And that process requires that any proposed new document, including a new web page, go through a legal review. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and also a review by various non-legal departments. Yes. And that process was followed in relation to the new content for the updated website in 2015? Yes. And the new content was approved on the 27th of November 2015? Yes. But the DCO, DCSO process was not used to check the new content when it was placed in the context of the updated website. Is that right? Yes. So the DCSO process wasn't used to review the website as it would look when it was made accessible to the public? Yes. Why not? It's a failure in the approach. Um, the content should always be reviewed in terms of how it will be presented to the um, customer. Allianz went ahead and launched the updated website on the 10th of December 2015. Yes. Was there any review of the updated website as a whole, as it would look to the consumer, before it went live? No. I want to take you to some emails from the night before, uh, from the night that the website went live. Could I ask that you be shown ALZ 0001 0011006? Now, the first email in the chain is at the end of the document, 0008. We see at 0008 that at 3.27 p.m. on the 10th of December 2015, uh, Jared Miller sent an email to a number of other people at Allianz. And we see that Mr Miller was the digital B2C manager. What does that mean, Mr Winter? Uh, B2C is business to consumer, so another word for direct. Now, Mr Miller said, colleagues, just a short note to let you all know that website refresh goes live this evening from 9pm. We are currently going through some of the final stages of testing in the staging environment to flush out any issues. So far, I'm happy to announce that we have only discovered a few images that are currently being migrated. Do you see that? Yes. Now, we see from that email that on the day of the website launch there was some testing in the staging environment and it only picked up issues with, as Mr Miller describes it, a few images. Yes. Then if we bring up triple zero six and triple zero seven, we see that the next email in the chain, which begins at the bottom of 0006 and goes over to 0007, um, was sent about two and a half hours later at 6.03 p.m. that day. Do you see that? Yes. So that was about three hours before the website was to go live at nine o'clock that night. Yes. Uh, now, this email is from Iona Luke, a corporate solicitor at Allianz. Yes. And she said, uh, Jared and I have completed a final review of the website in the staging environment. Do you see that at the top of the second page? Yes. And in the final two paragraphs, uh, she said, I note that product feature disclaimers and discount disclaimers are placed in a collapsible box at the bottom of each page with an asterisk tagged throughout the body of the web page to those products or discounts that need a disclaimer, all using the same symbol. 
This approach carries the risk of not being sufficiently clear in which disclaimer applies to which product feature or discount, especially when multiple disclaimers apply to a particular feature or discount, such as a no-claim bonus, which needs two disclaimers, the NCB disclaimer and the minimum premium disclaimer. We, we would argue that the bold disclaimer headings assist customers in finding the relevant disclaimers, but a regulator could take a different view. You need to be comfortable with accepting this risk. She then says, Corporations Act disclosures are not conditions, they are legal disclosures. I have therefore asked for those to be moved outside of the conditions apply box. Similarly, citations are not conditions. I've also asked for those to be moved outside of the conditions apply box. Now, then we see also on 0006 that on the 18th of December 2015, more than a week after the website went live, Ms Luke sent another email. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, she said, We've had a quick look at the site to sample a few pages just now and note the following. The Corporations Act disclosures are nowhere to be found. When we looked through the staging environment, we moved those outside of the collapsible conditions apply box. Jared, can you please reinstate these as soon as possible? Some of the symbols throughout the page indicating disclaimers do not link back to the conditions apply box. Given the product and discount disclaimers are within the collapsible conditions apply box and the symbols throughout the page do not clearly show there is a condition in the conditions apply box which applies, the risk is that ASIC could consider this is not clear disclosure. I note this was discussed in our review of the test site. The risk is particularly high in relation to no claim bonus disclaimers minimum premium disclaimers and price representations. Patrick and Nadine, can you please confirm the following? You are happy with accepting the risk of how the product and disclaimer discounts are represented? Whether you want us to do a full review of every page of the live website to ensure consistency, given that we had not been given the time to reconcile all new and old content. So we see from this email, Mr Winter, that the issues that Ms Luke identified three hours before the website went live were not dealt with? Yes. And you summarised the problems that were detected at this stage in your statement. They were that symbols used to indicate a disclosure didn't adequately link back to the conditions apply, which contained the disclosure? Yes. The full disclaimer wording was only viewable by clicking on a conditions apply box. Yes. And some Corporations Act disclosures were absent. Yes. Now, the website was accessible to the public for more than a week before these issues were identified. Yes. But after they were identified, did Allianz take down the offending parts of the website? No. Did Allianz revert to the previous version of the website until the issues could be fixed? No. Why not, Mr Winter? The previous version of the website gets superseded by the uploaded new content, so it's not, um, um, we're not capable of doing that in practice. What about taking down the offending parts of the website? It uh, wasn't considered um, appropriate at the time. It wasn't considered appropriate at the time. Mm -hmm. Why not, Mr Winter? Uh, I, th I think we were going to deal with the issues that have been identified and um, rectify them. You were going to deal with the issues and rectify them? Yes. But in the meantime, the website remained up and accessible to the public in this form? Yes. Now, we see in this email that Ms Luke sought confirmation of some matters from Patrick and Nadine. Yes. That was Patrick Brownsberger and Nadine Whittaker? Yes. Who were they? Patrick was, um, works in the direct business. Uh, he's head of new business in direct. And Nadine Whittaker at that time was uh, head of life. Head of life. Life. As a product manager role in life. All right. I tender the email chain, Commissioner. Emails of Allianz Australia. Insurance 10 December 15 to 18 December 15 concerning website refresh 
ALZ 0001011006, Exhibit 6.264. If that's a convenient time, Commissioner. Yes, we come back at two o'clock. Thank you, Commissioner. It could be good enough to be back in time to begin at two. And we'll adjourn until that time. Hearings, the Commission was told by the solicitors acting for Tal that Miss Van Eden could address the matters in relation to which she provided a statement. The Commission was told that this included addressing matters relating to, quote, underwriting, claims handling and dispute resolution. The Commission was informed of these matters in the context of the Commission having asked Tal consider whether there were other witnesses who were capable of responding to the rubrics. A number of other rubrics were issued to Tal and Tal provided statements from other witnesses in response to those rubrics. It's important to emphasise that at no time have counsel or solicitors assisting communicated to Tal or to any other party that their witnesses should not read or discuss what other witnesses, whether from the entity or not, have said in their statements. It was then surprising to hear that Miss Van Eden had not been shown the statements made by other TAL witnesses which had the potential to directly bear upon her evidence. It was also surprising that Miss Van Eden appeared to be unfamiliar with a number of documents that the Commission had foreshadowed that uh, she may be taken to. Where it is proposed to take witnesses to documents that have been produced to the Commission by the entity that the witness represents, those documents are generally provided to the entity in advance of the witness being called. In the case of Tal, all of the documents that were put to Ms Van Eden by counsel assisting were provided to the solicitors acting for Tal a number of days in advance of Ms Van Eden providing uh, her evidence. This is all. Commissioner, if we could have Mr Winter back in the witness box. Could you box. come back into the witness box, please, Mr Winter? Yes, Ms Orr. Uh, Mr Winter, I asked you questions before lunch about an email from the 18th of December 2015, which was about a, a bit more than a week after the website went live in 2015. Do you recall that? Yes. <clears throat> uh, now, I want to take you to another document, which is ALZ 0001 0011 001, which is an email chain from January 2016. So a few weeks later. Could we please display 0002 and 0003? Now, once we have both those pages on the screen, you'll see Ms. Uh, you'll see Ms. Luke's email sent on the 18th of December that I asked you about before lunchtime on the right-hand page. Do you see that? Yes. And then at the bottom of the left-hand page, we can see that on the 11th of January, Ms. Luke sent a follow-up email to Mr. Brownsberger and Ms. Whitaker. You see that? Yes. So they hadn't responded to her email? I'm not based on this, no. And above that, we see that later that day, Mr Brownsberger did respond to Ms Luke. Do you see that email? Yes. He said that he was on leave for two weeks, but that someone else would review in more detail. Yes. Do you see that he also said that his initial review did not seem to show a large risk especially when reviewed against other insurers? Yes. Now, 
If we turn to 0001, we see Ms Luke's reply to that email. On the 12th of uh, January, do you see that? Yes. And under the heading comparison with other competitors, Ms Luke pointed out that it was not reasonable to compare Alliance's website to its competitors. Yes. Alliance had to work out for itself whether it was complying with the law. Yes. And she identified further misleading content on the website. Yes. She said, uh, for example, on the About Us page, it states, peace of mind with a globally trusted company. Millions of people in Australia and worldwide rely on Alliance for their insurance needs. Alliance offers the security of a global insurance company while providing the personalised service you would expect from a much smaller company. You see that? Yes. And she said, this is not correct and misleading. We take great care in distinguishing between the local operating entity and the Alliance group. The Australian insurer is not a global company, nor does it offer the security of a global insurance company. Our insurance business is not backed by Germany. We do not provide personalised service in the sense that we do not provide personal advice. I will be raising a compliance incident to assure this content is rectified. Yes. Now, uh, after Ms Luke raised uh, these problems, these further problems with the website content, did Alliance take down the offending parts of the website? No. Why not? We are in the process of completing a review, or sorry, a process to review the entire website was initiated as a result of um, IONA's uh, review. And it, during that period, we identified um, three matters that we thought were of significance, and we set in place um, a series of actions to rectify and remediate those items. So we thought it was appropriate to honour the representation where we thought it was significant and misleading. I, I get in this instance it should just be corrected. Hmm. Um, but that was both the basis for not pulling down the website at the time. So you didn't correct these misleading assertions on your website at this time? Uh, yes, we did. We worked through that over the period of um, 2016. But at this time, Mr Winter, did you correct these matters that were drawn to your attention by your corporate solicitor? No. All right. I'll tender that email chain, Commissioner. Emails between 18 December 15 and 11, 12 January 16 concerning website refresh. Uh, ALZ 0001011 exhibit 6.265. Now, could I ask that you look at ALZ 0001040007? Now, this is an email chain from a bit later the same day, on the 12th of January 2016. And if we turn to the second and third pages of the email chain, 0002 and 0003. We can see that we can see Ms Luke's email that we were just discussing. Do you see that on the right-hand side? Yes. And above where that email starts at the bottom of the left-hand page, we see an email from David Parsons. Yes. He was the general manager of Direct. Yes. And he said he would take up Ms Luke's concerns. Yes. But he wanted more specific examples of her concerns. Do you see that? Yes. And if we turn to the first page, 0001, we see that Ms Luke gave more examples of misleading content on the website. You see that? Yes. And these ones came from the website pages that had not been submitted for review, which Ms Luke described as the supposedly reused content. Do you see that? Yes. 
She said that she'd found substantial errors on the home contents page. Yes. And she referred to a temporary accommodation benefit. Do you see that? Yes. She said, the agreement which Technical and I had with Erica was that the benefit is not to be advertised anywhere until we can come up with wording and qualifications that would address ASIC's concerns. Alliance has previously been warned by ASIC about advertising this benefit without appropriate qualification. Copy of ASIC letter attached for your information. When I met with Technical this morning to work through the wording, we found that this benefit has re-emerged on the Alliance website without appropriate qualification and with incorrect benefit description. Alliance would likely get enforcement action if ASIC sees us advertising this benefit again, despite ASIC's concern. You see that? Yes. So by this time, several different kinds of incorrect or misleading content had been identified on your website? Yes. Including content that ASIC had previously specifically told Alliance was misleading? Yes. Tender that email chain, Commissioner. Emails of 12 January 16 concerning website refresh, ALZ 0001-0140, uh, 007, Exhibit 6.266. Now, the next day, on the 13th of January 2016, a compliance incident was raised in relation to these issues. Yes. Uh, what's the effect of raising a compliance incident? So once a compliance incident's raised, it then goes through a process of review in terms of whether um, that incident is reportable, uh, and it also looks at what needs to be done to rectify that instance and, um, if required, how to uh, remediate um, for customers that are impacted. All right. Can I ask that you look at ALZ 0001 0140 0011? We see here that on the 29th of January, 2016, so a couple of weeks after the compliance incident was raised, Ms Luke sent an email to Corporate Compliance. Yes. And she said, parts of the Alliance web so website have gone live without sign-off. This matter has been escalated to GM of Direct, David Parsons. We have agreed with David and Sales Compliance, Sarah Allaby, that Direct will put the full website into DCSO for sign-off. You see that? Yes. And she then identified underneath that more aspects of the website that had been identified as being misleading. Yes. So by this stage, it was almost two months since the website had gone live? Almost, yes. And Alliance had been aware for that whole period that there were incorrect and misleading statements on the website? Yes. But Alliance had done nothing to take down any of the offending parts of the website? Yes. They had not? They had not. Uh, and as we saw, or as we see from the emails, Alliance had decided to review the product pages on the website, and I think you've given that evidence as well. Yes. All right, I'll tender this email chain, Commissioner. Emails of 29 January 16 concerning website refresh ALZ 0001-0140-0011, Exhibit 6.267. Now, that review of the product pages that Alliance decided to um, initiate, that review should have happened before the website went live? Yes. Uh, why didn't it? Um, there was a failure in the document compliance sign-off process where um, at that point, we only reviewed the new content um, and we didn't look at the entire site. Now, having decided to initiate that review of the product pages, how long did that review take? Uh, that review went through and um, so there's sort of two parts to this, if I could distinguish. So the review of all products other than travel uh, was completed um, in the first part of 2016, so by April. Um, travel insurance uh, was completed by November 
uh, of 2016. So the review process took about 10 months, is that right? Yes. Why did it take so long? Um, I would say we failed to give it the priority that it needed and um, to allocate uh, the, you know, the appropriate sort of resource and priority to it. And in that 10 month period, did Alliance at any time take the website down? No. The review identified numerous issues with the website, didn't it? Yes. Including issues that went far beyond uh, the issues that were identified by Ms Luke in these emails? Yes. By April 2016, the issues that had been identified in the review included three different types of incorrect or misleading statements in relation to home insurance products? Yes. Uh, and before the review was over, uh, numerous other incorrect or misleading statements were identified on other parts of the website? Yes. In relation to car insurance products? Yes. In relation to life insurance products? Yes. In relation to boat insurance products? Yes. And in relation to travel insurance products? Yes. Now, leaving the travel insurance policies to one side for the moment, you've annexed to your statement a list of the other incorrect or misleading representations that were identified on the website. If we could go to ALZ 0001 0092 0001, that's your statement, and the annexure is at 0027. If we could bring up 0027 and 0028 together. We can see that there were 14 different types of incorrect or misleading statements in relation to home insurance. Yes. There were four in relation to car insurance. Yes. And if we move to 0029, we can see that there were three in relation to life insurance. Yes. And one in relation to boat <coughs> insurance. Yes. Now, if we could go back to 0027 and 0028, and we look at the misleading content in relation to home insurance, we can see from the far right hand column that some of those misleading statements were removed in January of 2016. Yes. But others were not removed until March or April 2016. Yes. And in one case, in item eight, which related to the renters insurance webpage, the representation wasn't removed until April the following year, April 2017. Mm. Yes. When was that incorrect and misleading representation identified, the one in item eight? In early January 2016. In early January 2016. So why did it take until April 2017 to remove it from the website? Um, Madam Orr, in tendering my statement today, I had expected that that was going to be corrected because it was actually fixed in 2016 in April in line with the other changes. Are you saying there's a correction you need to make to your statement? Uh, I thought it had been made, but yes. We haven't informed the Commission of any correction to make, Commissioner. Uh, I, I had thought that your witness statement had been tendered on the basis that it was true and correct, Mr Winter. Uh, yes. Uh, but there is something in your statement that is not correct? 
Yeah, in um, the past week, I had identified and questioned that date because it stood out to me as well. Um, you know, why we would fix everything else other than that. And um, I went back and checked and it was fixed at 2016. I apologise that it um, wasn't corrected intended today. So what date should we read instead of 7 April 2017 in item 8 of this table? Um, 7 April 2016. I see. I can ask that you look at item 5. We see that many of the product features for home insurance policies on the website were missing significant qualifications or were missing sublimits. What's a sublimit? Uh, within a, a category of cover, it would be a limitation that might apply to an individual item within that category, for example. So a limit on the amount that could be recovered under the policy, is that yes. right? Yes. Uh, so many of the product features for home insurance were missing that information for the consumer? Yes. And if we look at item six, we see that the home insurance page said, we guarantee the quality of repairs. Yes. Did Allianz guarantee the quality of repairs under its home insurance policies? No. In item seven, we see that the home building insurance page used the liability cover wording from a different policy, a home contents insurance policy, which had more comprehensive liability cover. Is that right? Yes. Do you accept that these are troubling misrepresentations for you to have had on your website, uh, Mr Winter? Yes. You accept that they may well have misled numerous customers? Yes. Uh, and that they were contrary to financial services laws? Yes. Now, each of these incorrect or misleading statements was identified in the course of the review over the period from January to November 2016. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and did Allianz report those breaches to ASIC at any stage in 2016? No. Did it consider whether to report at least some of them to ASIC? Yes. Uh, and it decided not to? Yes. Now, the body that made the decision not to make a report to ASIC was Allianz's Management Risk and Compliance Committee? Yes. It made that decision in May 2016? Yes. And by May 2016, all but one of the... All, I'm sorry, I, I had been working on the assumption of the April 2017 date. We now know that all of the 14 incorrect or misleading representations in relation to home insurance policies had been removed. Yes. Why did it take Allianz until May 2016 to consider whether to make a report to ASIC? Uh, we had to do a detailed review to actually identify um, the issues that uh, were um, incorrect on the website. Um, and then in considering, once they're identified, you've actually, we needed to work through the significance of them and to identify you know, the impact um, that it would have on consumers. So that process took through, um, to get the fact base in place, took through till April. They were significant enough to be removed from the website in the course of January February and April 2016? Yes. And you were present at the meeting of the committee on the 6th of May 2016 when the decision not to report to ASIC was made? Yes. Uh, you've not exhibited the agenda or minutes of that meeting to your statement. Is that right? Yes. Uh, or any of the reports that were submitted for the purpose of that meeting? Yes. Instead, what you've exhibited for that meeting is one and a half pages of typed, undated notes that you tell us relate to that meeting. Yes. Those notes are Exhibit 11 to your statement, ALZ 0000672757. This is a two-page document, and it would be helpful if we could display both pages on the screen. 
these are the notes that you tell us relate to the meeting about whether to report these matters to ASIC in May 2016? Yes. Uh, did you make these notes? No. Who made the notes? As part of my submission or part of the meeting, sorry? Well, who created this document? Um, uh, our legal representation. When did this document... When was sorry, it... I might be confused here. Um, Can you explain to us what this document is? It represents um, an overview of the discussion or the, the, the minutes of that meeting, the ARICO meeting in May of 2016. It represents an overview of the discussion at the meeting, is yes. that right? Yes. When was it created? As part of putting my witness statement together. It's a document that's recently been created, is it? Yes. And who created it? Um, not me personally, but it was created as part of our legal team's effort to pull the documents together for this submission. So this is not a contemporaneous document from the meeting? No. This is a document that your lawyers have created, is that right? Yes. In preparation for you giving evidence at the Royal Commission? Yes. But you've described it as notes that relate to the meeting? Yes. So what was used by your legal team to create this two-page document? My understanding is it's an extract from um, the papers submitted at that meeting. Why did your lawyers not submit the papers that went to the meeting rather than creating this document to summarise or explain what was put to the meeting? Well, the papers for the um, that risk and compliance meeting uh, cover a whole range of topics. Yes. And my understanding was we, we, we um, narrowed that down to just present the information relevant to the rubric. Who narrowed that down, Mr Winter? I, I don't know. Did you narrow that down? No. Did you have any role in the preparation of this document? No. So just so that I understand, this is a document that your lawyers have created which you've annexed to your statement and described as notes that relate to the meeting? Yes. But we now understand it's a document your lawyers created recently to summarise or explain the contents of the reports that were submitted to that meeting? The, it's a direct extract from the notes from that meeting. Direct from, extract Sorry, direct from, extract from the papers submitted at that meeting. From which papers submitted at the meeting? The um, papers submitted at the, Arico, at the Alliance Risk and Compliance meeting. Now, the papers that were submitted at that meeting consisted of a number of different reports, didn't they? Yes. So which of the reports is this an extract from? I would say the, the documentation relating directly to that meeting. But do you agree with me that there were multiple reports submitted to that meeting? Yes. Are you able to tell me which report you think this is an extract from? Uh, sorry, there's a... Um, it would be a compliance risk report. A compliance risk report. And your understanding is that this is a direct extract from the contents of the compliance risk report created for the meeting on the 6th of May 2016? Yes. All right. Um, why not annex the compliance risk report? Because it didn't respond in full... Sorry, the, the full content of that report didn't respond to the rubric. I see. <coughs> Was the website breach, or as it's termed in this document that's recently been created, the direct website breach, was that the only matter that was considered at the meeting on the 6th of May 2016? No. Uh, now, if we look at the contents of this note, or this... I hesitate to refer to it as a note, uh, Mr Winter, this document, document. This document um, we see on the first page that the document refers to a multitude of errors on the website. Yes. 
it sets out some of the most significant errors. Yes. They include the statement about guaranteeing the quality of repairs on home insurance policies. Yes. Which Alliance did not do. No. Uh, and the statement about providing legal liability cover for home buildings cover, which again Allianz did not do. No. And then uh, the document records that there were approximately 120 further unique errors from minor to moderate. Yes. Where do we see those further 120 unique errors in the annexure to your statement? Um, they're captured in the overall headline summary. So rather than have the same, th sorry, the same error could appear on multiple web pages. So rather than list each web page, we've given um, the statement. But they're described as unique errors here. What do we understand that to mean? Well, unique to me would be one individual error. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 120 individual errors? Yes. But you've chosen to describe them to the Commission in a different way? Yes. Uh, presenting a much smaller number of errors in your statement? It's, this, it's the same core error, but rather than put it forward the same error you know, multiple times, we've given it to you in one um, summary. Sorry, I've given it to you as one item. But you didn't make clear, did you, that you were providing those as representative examples of much larger numbers of errors? To be clear, they're not representative examples of a large number of errors. They're the same um, where it makes a misleading statement or misrepresentation. That could be evident in the same way on a number of different landing pages. Mm -hmm. But where do we see in your statement your, or your annexure that those errors were present multiple times in multiple different parts of the website? No, you don't. And should we have, Mr Winter? Yes. Back to the, the document in front of us at the moment, we see that underneath the reference to the 120 unique errors, there's a note of the decision about whether to report the matter to ASIC. Do you see that? Yes. And the notes record Oh, I'm sorry, the document records that the breach was not reportable to ASIC. Do you yes. see that? Yes. And two reasons are given for that decision? Yes. The first is that only limited refunds to customers would be necessary? Yes. And the second was that you had a robust document compliance protocol. Is that what DCP stands for? Process. Process. A, a robust document compliance process. Is that the same as the DCSO process that I asked you about earlier? Yes. And the document records that it was just not followed in this instance? Yes. Now, I want to come back to that. Uh, but the document then goes on to say that the decision not to report to ASIC does rely on us making good on product representations at the claims end. Yes. So that was still being worked through? That had been agreed. Um, what had been agreed? That we would honour the representation in the significant issues identified. Well, where do we see that here in this document, Mr Winter? What we see is but does rely on us making good on product representations at the claims end still being worked through with David's team? Not clearly stated. Well, what this suggests is that the committee didn't know at this point whether Allianz would be able to make good on the incorrect and misleading representations when claims were made. That was still being worked through. Yes. The document then goes on to consider the causes of the misleading statements and we see that the document says, simple, authors of the pages did not follow the DCP process. I haven't heard a convincing reason for why. Do you see that? Yes. And then over the page at 2758, we see a list of actions. Yes. And they were general education of DCP requirement. Key, digital team will not make live without record of DCP approval and confirmation that web page in test environment is identical. 
websites more complex than print pages and becoming increasingly so, e.g. rotating banners, click-through notes, need to make sure all put into DCP, and business improvement review of DCP made aware and considering. You see that? They were the action items yes. according to this document. And in the last bullet point on the page, we see Nolene may have a view on the risk side. Disappointed to see ticket question. Has your business unit followed the document compliance sign-off process for all communications needing approval? Was compliant? Now, do we understand that to mean that the ticket system, can you explain what that is? Uh, tickets are internal compliance system that we use to um, manage compliance incidents and to get attestations from staff regarding um, their following compliance procedures. Right, so that's where your staff record that they have complied with compliance requirements. Yes. And what the ticket system showed in relation to the material uploaded to the website was that the business unit had followed the document compliance sign-off process uh, and approval was marked as compliant. Yes. What does that suggest to you, Mr Winter? It's an error. It's an error? Yeah, I mean, it's just inaccurate. They haven't followed it, so it should, the attestation should have been answered as no. Do th does it trouble you that they regarded their actions as being compliant? Yes. Well, I want to come back to the previous page, 2757, and the item that said, robust DCP system just not followed in this instance. Is that right? Do you agree with that assessment? Not with the benefit of hindsight, no. Was the document control protocol system uh, a robust system? I think it was a functioning system. I think that um, somewhere in that process we needed to call out, or we needed somebody to say, we need to see the full content, so I don't agree with the robust description. It was a functioning system, but not a robust system. Is that how you would describe it? Yes. What do you mean by a functioning system? Well, I've been back and looked at this in detail. If you looked at the number of items that are reviewed by the document compliance sign-off system, um, when it's followed, it functions well. In this instance, um, for whatever reason, it hasn't been followed, so... Um, I, I can't go as far as saying it's robust. Well, you say it was followed. Is that your evidence? No. I said I've seen plenty of examples where that it go was through followed. where it was followed and, and it functions well. And it was not followed in this instance? Yes. But it was followed in relation to the new content that was uploaded, is that right? The new content... Um, in my earlier evidence, I said we only submitted content as it related to the individual items, not how it was situated within the broader yes. site. Yes. So it wasn't followed for the integrated content, the new content integrated no. into the website. No. Um, and the document tells us that uh, who, whoever is intended to be quoted here, and we'll try and get to the bottom of that in this document under the heading cause, says, I haven't heard a convincing reason for why the DCP process was not followed. Do you see that at the bottom of the page? Yes. So it wasn't clear whether the process required only a review of the new content or a review of the new content when integrated into the further content, was it? No. And thus, action items that include more education about the DCP requirement? Yes. So the committee took the view that there was a lack of knowledge or understanding of the DCSO process? Yes. Uh, and uh, I want to suggest to you that what we see in terms of the characterisation of the errors, the cause of the errors and the actions to be taken in response to the errors indicates that there were clear problems known to the committee at the time of this meeting with the way the DCSO process was operating and being applied within Alliance. Yes. You accept that? Yes. Now, before we leave this document, I, I want to try and explore what document you say this is an extract from. 
uh, we have located a report that went to this meeting, um, which I'll bring up, ALZ 0001011200072. Now, this is the first page of a bundle of reports that appear to have gone to that meeting. I'll wait till it comes up and ask you if you've seen this before. Have you seen a bundle of reports that went to the meeting? Yes. And if we turn to 0087, We see there a report entitled Corporate Compliance. Yes. Now, is this the report that you think this document is an extract from? In part, yes. In part. What do you mean by that? This document won't have um, included the discussion points that are listed in my witness statement. So some of those, some of the points in the extract Yes. Or, um, that the Commissioner referred to as the document won't be included in full here. Where are they from then? Um, I would expect that they're from the minutes of that meeting. The minutes of the meeting? You mm -hmm. now think it's an extract of the minutes of the meeting? I think it's an extract from both. Do you, do you think it's a bringing together of parts of this report and parts of the minutes of the meeting? Yes. All right, could I ask that you look at 0094 within this document, which appears to be the relevant part of the compliance report, corporate compliance report. Do you see misleading content on Allianz website? Yes. Now, do you say that any part of the document, I'll refer to it as the document, comes from here? Yes. Where? Uh, if you read through um, root cause and remediation. Mm -hmm. Well, let's bring up the note against this document on the other side of the screen, um, ALZ 0001006727. If we could have that on one side of the screen and this document on the other, perhaps you could explain in what way you think the document constitutes an excerpt from the corporate compliance report. Uh, from It's, it's not word for word verbatim, it's I'm not, sorry. It's not an excerpt from that document, is it, Mr Winter? It's a, no, not a direct extract. Well, is it any form of extract from that document? No. Uh, I'll tender that bundle of reports for the meeting, Commissioner, the meeting on the 6th of May 2016. Bundle of reports, uh, meeting of ARICO, 6 May 15, ALZ 0001002072 becomes exhibit 6.268. Have you seen the minutes for the meeting, Mr Winter? Oh, I, I don't recall specifically. I would imagine I would have read the minutes post that meeting, yes. Mm -hmm. And what makes you think that the document on the left-hand side of the screen, screen is an excerpt from the minutes? Uh, it's just what I had expected it to be. I haven't got a... Um, you don't know if it is? No. It's just an expectation Expectation, you have. yes. All right. Now, I want to come back to what was decided at this meeting, um, for which we have the document on the left-hand side and now the bundle of reports, um, which include the page on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, the decision at that meeting was that the breach was not reportable to ASIC. 
Yes. Are you familiar with Section 912 Capital D of the Corporations Act, Mr Winter? Yes. You know that it requires Australian financial services licensees to report significant breaches of the law to ASIC? Yes. And are you familiar with ASIC Regulatory Guide 78? Um, not off the top of my head, no. Do you know that there's a regulatory guide issued by ASIC that deals with breach reporting by AFS licensees? Yes. Are you familiar with that document? Um, I would generally engage with our legal counsel and take advice on um, you know, nature of the law of that extent. I'll bring it up to assist you. It's RCD 0021 0001 0045. You can see that it's Regulatory Guide 78 entitled Breach Reporting by AFS Licensees. And if we turn to 0149 within the document, we see under the, under the question, what breaches or likely breaches must you report? Do you see that? Yes. Um, the regulatory guide says this, as an AFSS, AFS licensee, you must give us a written report as soon as practicable and in any case within 10 business days of becoming aware of a breach or likely breach. If you breach any of the specified obligations, you are likely to breach any of the specified obligations and that breach or likely breach is significant. You see that? Yes. And then at 0151, we see a heading what does significant breach mean? And underneath that, three paragraphs down, you must have regard to a number of factors listed in section 912D1B when deciding whether a breach or likely breach is significant. See table two. And if we go to table two at 0152 and 0153, We see that table two picks up each of the requirements in the subparagraphs of section 912D1B. Do you see that? Yes. Are you familiar with these matters that need to be considered in determining whether a breach or likely breach is significant? Yes. You know that they include the number or frequency of similar previous breaches? Yes the impact of the breach or likely breach on the ability to provide the financial services covered by the licence? Yes. The extent to which the breach or likely breach indicates that the licensee's arrangements to ensure compliance with those obligations is inadequate? Yes. And the actual or potential financial loss to clients arising from the breach or likely breach? Yes. I'll tender that. Um, in fact, I'm sorry, that, that document has already been tendered in another module. It's Exhibit 1.6, Commissioner. Now, um, I want to go back to the document that you described initially as the notes relating to the meeting, ALZ 0001-00672757. And again, if we could have 2757 and 2758 on the screen, I want to ask you where in that document we see any discussion of the number or frequency of similar previous breaches, which you know Allianz was required to have regard to by section 912D1B1. Where do we see that discussed? Uh, it's not there. Was it discussed? Not that I recall. You don't Sorry, recall I don't it recall. being discussed? I don't recall. But there's no record of it being discussed? No. Um, where do we see any discussion of the impact of the breach on your ability to provide the financial services covered by the licence? Uh, it's not stated there. Was it discussed? I don't recall. On the second page here, we see a reference to um, disruption from a breach like this is material. Do you see that at the second dot point on the right hand page?
Yes. So it would have had some impact on Allianz's ability to provide its financial services? Not directly, no. Well, where do we see consideration of that factor in the decision not to report the breach? That's not stated. And where do we see discussion of the extent to which the breach indicated that your compliance arrangements were adequate or inadequate? Uh, it's not stated. Was that discussed? I don't recall. I know there was a discussion. Um, sorry, there's a comment there relating to the robust compliance process. So um, I assume that was taken as meaning that um, our compliance systems um, were adequate. But they weren't adequate, were they, Mr Winter? Not in this instance. And they were known by the committee to be inadequate. We see that from the action items that the committee regarded as necessary to deal with this incident. Yes. Um, where do we see the discussion of the actual or potential financial loss to your customers arising from the breach? Uh, it, it's in the paper you um, referred to earlier as the ARICO uh, meeting paper. Mm -hmm. What do we see from that document or that set of documents? Um, the only financial impact that we identified at that time uh, were refunds to certain customers relating to a representation uh, for a, their eligibility for a discount. Um, and it lists, I think, if you, there was in the order of $3,000 of refunds that were made to customers. Mm -hmm. But at the time of the meeting, we see from the document on the screen that it wasn't clear whether Allianz would be able to make good on the representations when the claims were made. It's not stated there, no. No, no that is stated there. That it was... Uh, what, what is stating, stated there is that it was still being worked through as to whether Allianz would be able to make good on product representations at the claims end. Yes. Um, so where do we see the consideration of the potential loss to customers in the event that you could not make good on those representations? Uh, it's not stated. Was it considered? I think we always work from the basis of assuming that we would make good and honour that representation. You assumed that you would make good, but you didn't know whether or not you could. Yes. So I want to suggest to you that each of the four matters referred to in section 912D1B, which I took you to earlier, um, all led to the conclusion that this was a significant breach that needed to be reported to ASIC. We have a process for reviewing reportability. Um, it was followed in this case. Coming out of, the other, out of that process, we decided not to report. Um, what do you say to my suggestion that each of the four matters in section 912D1B, had they been considered, indicated that this was a significant breach that ought to have been reported to ASIC? I don't think that's the case for uh, the fourth point in terms of the significance for the, um, uh, the dollar impact to customers. Yes. Um, for the other three, I can see, uh, I agree uh, with your, with that you, that it, sorry, I agree that they could have been reported on that basis. This was the wrong decision, wasn't it, Mr Winter, not to report this to ASIC? Uh, yes. At the time of this meeting, the incorrect and misleading content had been on the website since at least December 2015, at least about five months? Yes. And the website had been accessible to the public throughout that period? Yes. Now, um, we are locating the minutes of that meeting, and I will come we, we do have those, ALZ 1000000920921. It's a three-page document, so perhaps if we could bring the first and the second page onto the screen. Four pages. We'll, we'll have the first and the second. The first and the second pages don't appear to deal with this matter. If we bring up, do you agree with that? Can you see any reference to this matter on the first or the second pages? No. 
let's bring up the third and the fourth pages of the minutes. We see there item seven, compliance update on the left hand side. Yes. Do you say that the document you annex to your witness statement is an excerpt or extract from these minutes? No. Attended the minutes, Commissioner. Minutes of Australian Risk Committee meeting 6 May 16, ALZ 100120 Exhibit 6.269. So I take it, Mr Winter, that you are unable to assist us to understand where the content of that document you've annexed to your witness statement came from? No, I can't. Now, when the decision was made not to report this matter to ASIC in May 2016, the review of the web pages was ongoing, wasn't it? Yes. And Alliance prioritised the review of the home insurance and car insurance pages over the pages that dealt with other types of insurance. Is that right? Yes. Why? Uh, it was a combination of the amount of content and um, the, the volume of people that visited those pages. Amount of content on the pages and the, the volume yeah, the of, number of people that visit the volume those sites. of visitors to those pages is that right yes they were the matters that led to the prioritization of home and car insurance over other types of insurance yes I could ask that you look at ALZ 000127. Now, you can see that this is an email from the 5th of February 2016. And if we bring up 0129 and 0130, we can see an email from Ms Luke to a group of people on the 3rd of February 2016. So you understand I've gone back now to February 2016. Yes. We were dealing with the May 2016 meeting. Um, an email from Ms Luke on the 3rd of February 2016 with the subject line, Alliance website review, scope of review and cost estimate. Do you see that? Yes. And we see that partway down the page she said, um, under next steps, one, David and Nadine, please review the estimate and the scope which are set out below and let me know if they are approved for your business units. External legal estimates that their external legal estimates that their review can be substantially completed by 12 February 2016 if they have approval to start work this week, with the balance to follow in the week of 15 Feb. You see that? Yes. And on the next page, she set out the cost estimate for the external legal review, which was a total of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. Do you see that there? Yes. And of that, thirteen thousand five hundred to fifteen thousand was to review all of the personal insurance pages. Yes. Now. If we move to 0128, we see that a couple of days later on the 5th of February, this is in the bottom half of the page, Ms Luke followed up on the cost approval for the external legal work. Do you see that? Yes. She appears to have been concerned that if approval wasn't given, there'd be further delays in removing the misleading content from the website. Yes. And above that, we see Mr Parsons, the general manager of Direct, said, the external costs are significant and therefore are currently sitting with Mick for approval. Now, is Mick you? Yes. And Mr Parsons went on, can you please confirm that you do not have the internal capacity to review our website? As based on the proposed costings, our preference would be internal review and utilising external when we are seeking clarification. Yes. 
And if we move to 0127, we see Ms Luke's response to that email. She set out a proposal if there wasn't approval of the costs for external legal review. Do you see that? Paragraph one, due to lack of internal capacity at this current time and the need to meet other existing work commitments, from the week of 15 Feb, I will spend two days a week to review the website internally, starting with Home and Motor until the whole website review is complete. I will share some of the work with my colleague Fatima so the direct and life teams can expect some queries from either myself or Fatima. In terms of priority, we will do home, motor, life, business in that order, noting that life have some serious issues, so we will do what we can to give it some priority as well. For travel, EHA and RSA, what are those? Uh, EHA is emergency home assistance and RSA is roadside assistance. For each of those, we will wait for Sarah to confirm who bears this cost, FI? Uh, financial institutions. Or direct, before we review any further. Any external advice we obtain on these pages, we will share them with AGA Legal, that's AWP Legal, yes. to ensure we are all on the same page. Now, Mr Winter, did you give approval for the costs for the external legal review? The external, I don't recall specifically, the external legal review never proceeded, so I'd assume not. Well, it seems to have been sitting with you for approval. We saw that from 0128. Did you or did you not provide approval? No. And why not? Uh, I thought on the, these decisions are always a trade-off. I thought we would complete the review internally. You thought it was better to have your corporate solicitor work on this presentation a week around her other work until it was done? Yes. Was that the right decision? No. How much did the review ultimately cost? Do you know? I don't know. Do you know anything about how it compares to the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar estimate if it had been done by the external lawyers um, in February? I think if you traced it right through to today, it would be substantially more. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'll tender that email chain, Commissioner. Emails of uh, 5 February 16 concerning Allianz website review, scope of review and cost estimates, ALZ 0001, 0102, 0127, Exhibit 2.270. Now, I want to suggest to you, Mr Winter, that your decision not to approve external lawyers to deal with this in February was reflective of a lack of prioritisation within Allianz of fixing this problem. Yes. You accept that? Yes. So the review instead was done internally and took about 10 months to complete? Yes. And the first stage of the review involved, up, involved uploading all of the web pages to the DCSO system? Yes. That took until April 2016? Yes. And Ms Luke then reviewed those pages herself to identify issues? Yes. And by about mid-May 2016, she'd identified 28 issues in relation to the travel insurance content? Yes. Uh, and Allianz was ready to begin, you say, preparing a rectification plan for the travel insurance content. You recall that? Yes. Um, at that time, when you were ready to begin preparing a rectification plan for the content, did you reconsider whether or not to report this to ASIC? No. Why not? I think by that stage, travel had... Um, we'd made the decision around the products other than travel and uh, for, we just failed to actually stop and consider travel as a separate matter. Even though Ms Luke had identified 28 new issues in relation to the travel insurance content? Yes. Should you have considered whether to report it to ASIC? Yes. Should it have been reported to ASIC at that time? Yes. Now, before that rectification plan that you've mentioned for the travel insurance content could be prepared, 
something happened at Allianz, didn't it? Someone noticed that not all of the travel insurance content had been uploaded to the DS DCSO system in the first place. Yes. So all of the content had to be reloaded. Yes. And re-reviewed. Yes. So the process was extended by a number of months. Yes. And by the end of August 2016, Ms Luke um, expected to complete her review by the end of September 2016. You tell us that in your witness statement. Yes. So more than eight months after the website went live, the review was still ongoing. Yes. But you hadn't approved and could have approved the twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars for the external lawyers who would have completed it in February. Yes. Now, um, from at least May, if not earlier, Allianz knew that there were misleading and incorrect statements in the travel insurance content, didn't it? Yes. And it didn't take down the travel insurance pages on the website? No. Why not? I don't believe it was ever considered. I think we looked at it and thought, fix the issues that were um, uh, needed to be corrected. Well, why not? Um, take the misleading statements down while you were fixing the issues, Mr Winter? I agree that was a course of action. We just decided we didn't actually consider doing that. Should you have considered that? I think that's reasonable, yes. Again, this is demonstrative, I want to put to you, of Allianz not prioritising compliance and compliance with the law. Yes. You accept that? Yes. Now, the review wasn't completed by the expected deadline of the end of September. We've heard that already. And another factor that extended it was that on the 22nd of September, AWP issued a supplementary PDS in relation to a travel insurance product. Yes. And as a result of that, another review needed to be done? Yes. To assess whether that supplementary PDS raised further issues with the website? Yes but you didn't take down the travel insurance part of the website while that further review was happening? No. And that re review was completed on the 18th of October 2016? Yes. And following that, Allianz's legal team prepared an issues list and proposed rectification plan? Yes. How long did it take to prepare that, do you recall? Uh, that was put to AWP in November of 2016. Okay, so between October and November to prepare that plan. Now, I want to take you to that document. It's Exhibit 12 to your witness statement, ALZ 0000670064. This is the issues list and proposed rectification plan that Allianz's legal team created. Yes. And it was provided to AWP in November 2016? Yes. And at the top, we see a few dot points setting out what Allianz wanted AWP to do with this document. Do you see that? Yes. Allianz wanted AWP to go through each item within the context of each web page and determine whether the statement is clearly inconsistent with the PDS and therefore have to honour whether the statement is missing significant qualifications, but because of how it is presented, there is an arguable position that it is possible to rely on the PDS, and consider whether the statement is missing significant qualifications, but because of placement of any further explanation or reference to PDS or disclaimer, the disclaimers are ineffective, in which case AWP is to decide what the remediation needs to be. You see that? Yes. Now, nothing in these points conveyed to AWP that Allianz regarded this as an urgent task, did it? No. Should it have? Yes. And underneath that, in the left-hand column of the table, we can see the issues that Allianz had identified with the travel insurance content. We can see that the first concerned a statement on the website that wherever you're travelling, whatever your needs, Allianz Travel Insurance has the range of options to provide the right travel cover for your budget. That was the representation? 
Yes. Does Allianz Travel Insurance apply wherever you're travelling? No. In the next column, we can see that there were two issues identified with this. Misleading because A, policy has an exclusion not covering areas where DFAT has provided travel warnings for. B, to state that the policy is right for your budget would imply the insured's personal circumstances are taken into account, personal advice. In reality, Allianz is unaware of the customer's budget. Uh, and in the third column, under the heading breach, we see that this was described as a misleading or deceptive statement. Do you agree that it was misleading, Mr Winter? Yes. Do you agree that it was deceptive? Yes. And the next item in the table uh, was the statement, and we might need to um, blow this up a bit because the lettering is very small, our basic travel insurance includes unlimited cover for overseas emergency medical assistance and medical or hospital expenses at a very reasonable price. Now, did that product include unlimited cover for overseas medical expenses? No. Under the policy, Allianz would pay only up to $1,000 for certain medical expenses, wouldn't it? Uh, yes. And in the third column, under the heading breach, we'll just need to pan back out, we see that this was also described as a misleading or deceptive statement. Do you agree that it was misleading? Yes. And deceptive? Yes. And if we turn across to 0065, we see that some of the issues are highlighted in red. What did that mean? I take it to mean they were the most um, significant and of highest concern. Most significant and? Of greatest concern. Of greatest concern. Now, I don't want to go through um, the entirety of this document, but do you agree that by the time this lengthy issues list and rectification plan was completed on the 24th of November 2016, there could have been no doubt that there were numerous misleading and deceptive statements about travel insurance products on Allianz's website? Yes. So did Allianz move at this time to take down the travel insurance pages? No. Why not? Um, again, it wasn't even considered an option at that stage, I don't believe. Did Allianz move to report the matter to ASIC at this time? No. Should it have? Yes. The only action that Allianz took at this time, having created this issues list and rectification plan, was to send it to AWP? Yes. And you say in your statement that Allianz sent it to AWP for action. Yes. Do you recall you used that phrase? Yes. You didn't exhibit the communication from Allianz to AWP about the issues list to your statement, but I want to bring it up for you. It's AZW. I'm sorry, we have that now. If we could also bring up 0326. You can see the email that starts at the bottom of the first page. That's an email from Ms Luke uh, to others within Allianz, including Erica Nock. She was part of the retail distribution group. Yes. Uh, and this is an email from the 24th of November 2016. Ms Luke attached the issues list for the travel pages to her email. Yes. And over the page she said, I suggest sending the list to AWP and have them come back with their recommended actions on the issues list and have them mark up the web pages for our review. You see that? Yes. 
And then if we go back to the first page, above the email from Ms Luke, we see that Ms Nock sent the document to Joe Moore. Yes. He was from AWP. Yes. She said, as per the comments below, we need someone from AWP to review the attachment and discuss with your product and legal the comments in the notes section of the document. Then mark up the document with the actual action agreed to be taken and we can then discuss. Yes. I'll tender that email. Emails between Allianz and AWP of November 16, ALW, uh, AZW? AZW. AZW, treble zero one, double zero one two zero three two five, exhibit 2.271. So by this stage, November 2016, it had been almost a year since the new website had gone live and these issues had first started to be identified? Yes. In that time, Allianz had identified a lengthy list of issues with the travel insurance pages? Yes. Those travel insurance pages had been accessible to the public the entire time? Yes and potentially influencing decisions by customers about whether to purchase Allianz travel insurance? Yes. Did Allianz give AWP a time frame within which it wanted them to develop the plan for how to fix the travel insurance pages? No. No time frame? Not that I've been able to find, no. And so having formed the view that there were misleading and deceptive statements about travel insurance, on the website, there was no deadline imposed on AWP to take action? No. And there was no attempt to convey to AWP in any way that this required an urgent response? Not in the email, no. Have you seen any other communication indicating that this required an urgent response from AWP? No. Uh, had Allianz told AWP about any of the misleading content before this time? I can't be sure. I haven't, I'm, I'm assuming this was the first occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, the day after Allianz gave the issues list to AWP, AWP told Allianz it would get its legal and product teams to review it. You tell us that in your statement? Yes and that it would provide Allianz with comments? Yes. Why didn't Allianz just fix the travel insurance pages on the website? It's our website page. The landing page is our website page. It should have been fixed at the time. Allianz should have fixed it? Yes. Um, or you could have told AWP the changes that they needed to make. Did you do that? We're in control of our own landing page, so we should have done it ourselves. So why was this sent to AWP for their comment in the first place? I think it goes to the nature of AWP being um, the underwriting agency with responsibility for travel. And so we've put it to them to review uh, to make sure that it, uh, our understanding, our interpretation lined up correctly. But you didn't need to do that? You accept that today? You could have gone ahead and fixed the website yourself? Yes. But Allianz elected not to do that? Yes. So by this time, your lawyers had spent at least eight months reviewing the website and creating the issues list and rectification plan. What more was there for AWP to do? AWP needed to review it again, make sure that it lined up, our interpretation of it had lined up exactly with um, uh, how the product worked. Um, I agree with you, it wasn't a necessary step. Mm -hmm. So. A couple of months later, by early February 2017, you didn't have any response from AWP to the issues list, did you? No. So you followed up? It was followed up, yes. Yes. Well, I'll ask you to look at AZW We see the email. Uh, unfortunately, the um, sender has been redacted from the top of the page, but we can see from the footer that this is an email from Erica Nock. Do you see that? Yes. To Joe Moore yes. on the 2nd of February 2017. And Ms Nock said, Hi Joe, following up on the below email trail and apologies if you have replied already and it has been lost in my inbox. 
If you can confirm your legal team's position on these items, we would like to resolve this compliance incident as soon as possible. Yes. No sense of urgency conveyed in this email. Mr Winter? No. Do you agree that it was now, if it had not already been for some time, urgent that this be fixed? Yes. I tender that email, Commissioner. Email from Noctomore to February 17, AZW 0001 Exhibit 2.272. So the issues list was provided to AWP in November 2016. This follow-up from Allianz occurred in February 2017, a couple of months later. When did AWP ultimately return the issues list with comments to Allianz? Not until May 2018. May 2018? Yes almost 18 months after Allianz asked AWP to provide the comments on the issues list. Yes. And the incorrect, misleading and deceptive statements about travel insurance were accessible by the public over that further 18-month period? Yes. Why did it take AWP so long to give you their comments on the issues list? I think they simply failed to prioritise it. As Allianz had done? Yes. You tell us in your statement that Allianz followed up with AWP in relation to the issues list a couple of months after it was handed over in February 2017. Is that a reference to this email? Yes. Uh, and then nothing else happened until July 2017 when you tell us that it was discussed, it was one of a number of matters discussed at a general regular work in progress meeting between Allianz and AWP. Yes. What was the nature of the discussion in that meeting? Uh, from my understanding, it's, it was simply um, raising it again with AWP and asking them to obtain a status of when those items would be addressed. So a request for a status update? Yes. And between July 2017 and May 2018, there were another 13 work in progress meetings at which Allianz asked for a status update? Yes. Uh, did you attend those meetings? No. Who attended those meetings? Uh, members of the uh, direct team. Uh, and sorry, and on, by phone, members of the AWP team, sales team. And it was a standing agenda item at each of those work in progress meetings? Yes. Uh, and no deadline was ever set in any of those meetings for the return of AWP's comments to Allianz? No. Then in June this year, the CEO of AWP, Craig Dalzell, sent you an email about what had happened over this period. Have you, do you recall that email? Yes. He attached a chronology of events. Yes. Uh, I'll show you that email, which is AZW 0001 008 It is, um, I'm going to the chronology, which is an attachment to the email. Would it assist you if I showed you the email as well? I'm familiar with it. You're familiar yes. with the email. So this is the chronology that Mr Dalzell, the CEO of AWP, sent to you on the 7th of June this year? Yes. And if we look at item three, Mr Dalzell says that on the 24th of November 16, the issues list was sent to AWP. Yes. Then item four, 22nd of December 16, it was sent by AWP Sales to AWP Legal. Yes. Then in the fifth item, we see that there was some disagreement between AWP's legal team and Allianz's legal team. What was the nature of that disagreement? I don't know. Then nothing happened for a long time, according to this chronology, until June 2017 when AWP sent the issues list and Allianz's comments to an external law firm for review. Do you see that? Yes. So Allianz had spent eight months reviewing the website. 
and AWP and its legal team had had a further six months to review it, and then they asked another law firm to review it as well. Yes. And we see from item seven that in February this year that law firm completed its review. Do you see that in item seven? Yes. And then AWP's legal team had to review their feedback. You see that in item seven? Yes. And in March 2018, AWP finally produced a version of the website showing the changes that were needed. We see that from item eight. Yes. You tell us in your statement that that was given to Allianz in May this year? Yes. And a member of Allianz's legal team then realised that the incorrect and misleading content that had been detected in 2015 had never been removed from the website? Yes. And he escalated the matter? Yes. But you told us that the issues list had been uh, a topic of discussion at 14 meetings between July 2017 and May 2018? Yes. So someone at Allianz who had attended those meetings knew that the content had never been removed from the website? Yes. Why didn't the matter get escalated without, within Allianz before then? I think it shows or demonstrates a poor understanding of the, our responsibilities in the AWP relationship. What were the responsibilities of Allianz in the AWP relationship? Well, it's our product, our licence, we're fully responsible. Uh, and if we go back to the chronology, we see at point 14 that Mr Dalzell said, throughout the period from November 2016 until recent escalation, it is our understanding that this matter was never singled out as an urgent priority, as an urgent priority action item in the Allianz Direct and AWP fortnightly work in progress meetings. And as noted in the ongoing Allianz Direct AWP work in progress document, in the regular meetings which occurred between AWP and Allianz, other matters were discussed and prioritised over this item. Is that a fair assessment of what occurred, Mr Winter? I don't believe so, no. How would you characterise what occurred? While it might not be stated explicitly in the documents, I think any time that there's a work in pro, an items list that identifies things that are misleading and deceptive and significant, it should be apparent to anyone involved that they need to be fixed with urgency. So you, you think that AWP should have worked out that this was urgent? Yes. Despite you needing to convey that to them? Yes. Despite any need for you to convey that to them, they should have worked it out themselves? Yes. But you hadn't treated this as an urgent matter, had you? No. Right, I, I need to tender the chronology, but before I do that, Commissioner, I need to tender an earlier document. I, I need to tender, I'm sorry, for completeness, the email to which the chronology which is attached. The email is AZW0000876064. And the email is dated 7 June 2018. Uh, email of 7 June 18, AZW0001 0008 and it's attached chronology, AZW0001 0008 7606 together will become exhibit 2.273. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, Mr Winter, before we move on, I want to put some propositions to you. Allianz identified in December 2015 that there was incorrect and misleading content on the travel insurance pages of its website, as well as other parts of the website. Yes. And in the period between December 2015 and May 2018, Allianz and AWP undertook a series of reviews that either identified additional misleading content or confirmed the results of the previous reviews. Yes. And over that whole period of approximately two and a half years, <coughs> the incorrect, misleading and deceptive content was accessible to the public on your website. Yes. And not only did Allianz not take the offending parts of the website down, 
your evidence is that Allianz didn't consider taking those parts of the website down? Not during that period. Allianz didn't make any report to ASIC in that period? No. Neither Allianz nor AWP acted with any sense of urgency to fix the issue? Yes. Neither Allianz nor AWP appreciated the seriousness of the issue, did they? No. And every day that that website was accessible to the public, Allianz was contravening financial services laws? Yes. But Allianz did not care enough to fix it? Yes. You've worked at Allianz since 2001. Is that right? Yes. How would you describe its culture? Its compliance culture or culture generally, sorry? Well, is it a culture that takes compliance, compliance with the law, seriously? Yes. Where do we see that in this series of events, Mr Winter? You don't. It wasn't taken seriously enough to spend $25,000 on a review of the website once it had been identified that it contained misleading representations? No. It wasn't taken seriously enough to report the representations to ASIC? No. It wasn't taken seriously enough for Allianz to want to take the offending parts of the website down? No. Or even consider whether it should do that? No. And it wasn't taken seriously enough to act with any sense of urgency to fix the misleading and deceptive statements on the website? No. Because taking down the website would have cost the business money, and at Allianz it's more important to protect the bottom line than to stop misleading your customers. I don't think it's more important to um, protect the bottom line. I think it should absolutely be more important to protect the customer. Well, I want to put to you that the se sequence of events that I've taken you to demonstrate that it was more important at Allianz to protect the bottom line than to stop misleading your customers. Yes. Do you accept that? In this instance, yes. Now, given the time that had passed between November 2016 when the issues list was given to AWP and May 2018, when it was discovered that nothing had been done, Allianz decided to engage an external law firm to do yet another review of the travel insurance web pages and the purchase paths. Is that right? Yes. And based on that review, you've set out in your statement a table of 39 statements from the travel insurance web pages that you consider may have been incorrect or misleading. Yes. I'll take you to those 39 statements at, in your witness statement at ALZ 0001 0092 0001 is your statement, and I'd like to go to 0013 in your statement. Now, 0013 is the first page of a table setting out the 39 statements. We can see that the table sets out a description of the incorrect or misleading content. Do you see that? Yes. The date the content was introduced onto the website. Yes. And the date it was removed from the website. Yes. And the final column shows us the type of travel insurance policy that was affected by the uh, misrepresentation. Yes. Now, if I take you first to the date introduced column, most of the dates in that column throughout this table are from 2012. Yes. So most of the misleading and incorrect statements about travel insurance on your website were not introduced when the website was updated in December 2015. They had been there since 2012. Yes. But they were not identified between 2012 and 2015? No. And when they were identified in 2015, we've seen that 
Nothing was done to fix them until 2018. Yes. And some of those incorrect or misleading statements therefore remained on Alliance's website for almost six years. Yes. Do you have any observations to make about that, Mr Winter? Yeah, I think um, what it illustrates is we haven't had a process of regular ongoing review of website content, so um, there's some failings in the document compliance and monitoring process and the supervision of agents uh, that we're actually addressing at the moment. I want to take you to just a few examples of the misleading content. I'll ask you to look at item three in the table. We see that for three different policies since July 2012, the benefits table said that overseas medical assistance was unlimited. But it wasn't, was it? No. A sublimit applied? Uh, two sublimits applied. Uh, one was 15,000 for funeral cover and the other was 1,000 for emergency dental. Yes, and we see that item three relates to funeral cover and item nine relates to the sublimit for emergency dental cover. Yes. Um, so it was wrong to tell customers that overseas medical assistance was unlimited. Yes. Does Alliance know how many people had their claims denied on the basis of those sublimits? Uh, there are no claims denied on the basis of the sublimits. Um, we're working through the impact to customers and we're quantifying that at the moment. You're still quantifying the impact of these particular misrepresentations on customers? We've engaged uh, a third party consultancy, the forensic uh, accountants, to work through um, we've completed uh, that review for approximately 10% of the um, group of, of customer claims during that period of um, uh, that the misrepresentations were made. So we're very, um, we expect to meet with ASIC shortly to propose a remediation program. If we turn to item 19 on 0015, We see that since July 2012, the web page for the comprehensive travel insurance policy used the phrase, wherever you're travelling, whatever your needs. Did the policy listed here, the comprehensive plan, apply wherever a customer travelled? No. There was an exclusion, as we saw from the issues list, for areas for which DFAT had issued travel warnings? Yes. Does Alliance know how many people had claims denied on the basis of that exclusion? No. When did Alliance take down the travel insurance pages of the website? Uh, on the 6th of June 2018. The 6th of June this year? Yeah, I think that's the correct date, yes. It's the date that you give in your witness statement, yes. uh, Mr Winter. And you say in your statement that after the realisation in May this year that the incorrect and misleading content was still on the website, Alliance also identified that a similar issue could affect the purchase paths and not just the website. Yes. So Alliance disabled its purchase path as well? Yes. And that happened on the 12th of June this year? Yes. Now, you tell us in your statement that during the period when the incorrect or misleading statements were on the website, AWP sold more than 600,000 Alliance travel insurance policies online and through its call centre. Yes. Is that figure correct? Yes. Now, I want to come back to that figure, Mr Winter. You don't know how many were sold via the website and how many were sold via telephone? No. You tell us in your statement that 22,450 claims have been made under those policies? Yes. Is that figure correct? Yes. Do you know how many of the people who bought travel insurance or made a claim under their travel insurance during that period were affected by the incorrect, misleading or deceptive representations? No. 
Do you know how long it's going to take Allianz to figure that out? Oh, as I said, we're very close to meeting with um, ASIC to propose the remediation program that's subject to ASIC approval. Um, we would then, the way we're setting it up is so that we can actually issue refunds or checks, additional claims payments to customers without the customer needing to take any action. So I think once we have ASIC approval, we'll move quite quickly. Has Allianz contacted its customers to tell them about this? Not yet, no. Why not? Well, we need to actually identify who's been affected before we would contact them. Well, when do you plan to let customers know that any of this occurred? Uh, following a, approval from ASIC in relation to the remediation program. You don't know when that will be? I expect that's going to happen um, uh, very shortly, but I couldn't give you an exact date. The travel insurance section of the Allianz website is now back up? Yes. And have you removed all the incorrect, misleading and deceptive statements from the website? Uh, the only information that appears on the website relates to how to make a claim. All the other content is yet to be um, put back live. I see. And the purchase path is operational again as well? Yes. Have the incorrect and misleading and deceptive statements been fixed in the purchase path? Yes. And whose responsibility was it to oversee that project? Uh, Craig Delzell. The CEO of AWP? Yes. <coughs> Have the people at Allianz involved in the failures to rectify the incorrect, misleading and deceptive content faced any disciplinary consequences as a result of this? No. No disciplinary consequences? No. Will they face any disciplinary consequences? Well, we haven't got to that as a discussion yet. Haven't considered that? Not yet. Now, Mr Winter, between December 2015, uh, when the website refresh happened, and May this year, there have been quite a lot of changes at Allianz, haven't there? Yes. Um, we'll hear more about some of them from the next witness, Ms Callaghan. But around November last year, Allianz introduced a compliance transformation program. Yes. And part of the aim of that program was to change the culture at Allianz? Yes. And part of the program involved changes to Allianz's process for considering whether to report matters to ASIC as a significant breach of the law? Yes. A new committee was established, the Breach Review Committee, in May this year. Yes. And another part of the Compliance Transformation Program involved the Breach Review Committee reviewing open incidents. Is that right? Yes. And one of the Breach Review Committee's first tasks was to review this incident about the travel insurance section on the Allianz website. No, the, no, I don't think that's correct. I think the Breach Review Committee, one of its first tasks was to review the integrated path matter that we've recently reported to ASIC. Well, what happened on the 21st of May this year in the meeting of the Breach Review Committee oh, that was held on sorry, that date? My apology. I was, I've confused. Um, yes. In answer to your question, yes. So the Breach Review Committee was established in May mm -hmm. and on the 21st of May it considered the events that I've taken you to. Is yes. that right? Yes. You attended the meeting? Yes. And at that meeting the committee decided to report the matter to ASIC? Yes. And on the 4th of June this year Allianz notified ASIC? Yes. Uh, and could I take you to the notification? It's Exhibit 17 to your witness statement, ALZ 0001 0067 0010. This is the letter that was sent to ASIC by the Head of Compliance at Allianz. Yes. It's a very brief letter. Yes. And in it, the Head of Compliance said, Allianz has identified potentially misleading and deceptive content with respect to the travel insurance section of the Allianz website. Yes. And she went on to say in the final paragraph, we are currently investigating this matter and seeking confirmation of certain information from the relevant business unit. We will provide further detail as soon as we are able to. 
Now, Alliance sent another letter to ASIC about a week later, on the 12th of June this year. Yes. You've exhibited that letter to your statement as Exhibit 18, ALZ 0001 0067 Now, if we could have... Uh, the final page of the letter on the screen as well, 0061, we'll see that the authors of this letter were you and Ms Callaghan, Alliance's Chief Risk Officer. Yes. And on the first page, you and Ms Callaghan gave a description of the breach. Yes. And then if we could take down 0061 and bring up 0060, We'll see that at the bottom of the first page and over into the second page, uh, you said, we understand that the potentially incorrect statements on the website in relation to travel insurance products have included statements which represented that certain benefits were higher than provided for under the policy document and product disclosure statement, were not appropriately qualified in certain places where this was necessary, for example, certain statements about benefits should have been qualified as being subject to eligibility and other conditions set out in the policy, or were inconsistent with other statements on the Alliance website, such as help statements or in the PDS, and did not include certain required disclosures. Now, um, also on this page, under the heading, the number the number or frequency of previous breaches. Do you see that, 2.1? Yes. You said, Alliance has reviewed its breach register and at this stage it has identified seven matters which may be considered similar to this breach, the earliest recorded in December 2011. These matters are currently being reviewed to verify details. Yes. Information about those seven matters is given by Ms Callaghan in her statement. Are you aware of that? Yes. Were those the only other matters that Alliance considered similar to this breach? Yes, to my knowledge, yes. There were another six similar matters that Alliance had reported to ASIC over the period from 2011 to 2015, weren't there? Yes. So there were the seven matters referred to in this letter, but you didn't refer to an additional six that had been reported to ASIC over that period. Do you agree? Well, in drafting this response, we obviously uh, there's a process involved that would involve um, uh, input from legal, and I would have acted on the advice of um, our legal counsel in terms of what matters were relevant to this letter. Do you agree that there were six other similar matters that had been reported to ASIC which you did not mention in this letter? I can't be certain. Do you recall 46 other similar matters that had not been reported to ASIC also being drawn to your attention in a memo that went to the 21 May Breach Review Committee meeting? Yes. Perhaps if we could bring up ALZ 0001001009029. This is the memorandum uh, prepared for the purposes of the 21 May 2018 Breach Review Committee meeting. Yes. It's a memorandum dated the day before, the 20th of May. Yes. It's prepared by a corporate compliance officer. Yes. And it's addressed to Ms Davidson, the head of compliance and chair of the breach review committee. Yes. But you also received a copy. Yes. And it was prepared for the purpose of the meeting on the 21st of May. Do you agree? Yes. Which was convened to consider whether this was a serious breach to be reported to ASIC. Yes. And if we turn to... 9031, we see under the heading, is this a significant breach? And the subheading, the number or frequency of similar previous breaches, there's a table headed similar matter reported. 
Yes. You see that? Yes. And if we also bring up 9032. And 9033, we'll see that there's six reported matters referred to in that table. Do you see that? Yes. Which were regarded as similar matters that had been reported to ASIC. Yes. Uh, now, they related to incorrect PDS links on the websites of distributors of Allianz products. Yes. And other errors identified on the Alliance website and websites of those distributors. Yes. Over the period from 2011 to 2015. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. The 15 is the latest date. Yes. yes. And with the exception of the fourth matter in the table, which is the one relating to one cover, do you see that on the left hand side? Yes. None of the incidents were referred to in the letter to ASIC on the 12th of June. No. Should they have been? Yes. And then on the right hand side, under similar matters not reported, we see from the 20th of November 2012 to the 26th of March 2018, there have been 46 website related incidents raised in ticket, which either may not have been assessed for reportability or have been assessed and deemed not reportable. So 46 other similar incidents raised in your internal compliance system. Yes. Do you think it's important for Allianz to be honest and transparent in its dealings with the regulator, Mr Winter? Yes. Do you think it's important for ASIC to know about the number of previous similar incidents when Allianz reports a significant breach? Yes. So why didn't you and Ms Callaghan provide ASIC with information about all these other similar website related incidents? I think we took a decision to um just note based on the major items listed in that table, so. Just to tell ASIC about the major items. The ones that had been previously um, reported as breaches, yes. Well, we've identified that there were other matters that had previously been reported as breaches that you didn't identify in your letter to ASIC. Yes. Should you have? Yes. I tender the um, memorandum dated the 20th of May 2016, Commissioner. Memorandum for Breach Review Committee Incident Breach Website Breach 20 May 18 ALZ 0001 0071 Exhibit 2.274. Now, if we go back to the letter dated the 12th of June that you sent to ASIC, ALZ 0001 0067 And we turn to the third page of that letter, which is 0061. We see that you also told ASIC under the heading how long the breach lasted. It appears that the incorrect travel insurance related website content has been displayed on the Alliance website from around December 2015. Alliance is conducting further retrospective testing to verify that this date is correct for all content under review. So that was what you said to ASIC at this point about how long the information had been on the website? Yes. And on the 20th of June, you got a response to this letter from ASIC? Yes. Uh, and if we go to that response at Exhibit 19 to your witness statement, ALZ 0001 0067 we see that ASIC asked Allianz to provide more information about its investigations into the matter by the 20th of July this year. Yes. Now, Allianz sent a response to that letter. Yes. Before I come to that response, I want to take you to some other documents that show what was happening at Allianz in June and July. You told us earlier that Allianz engaged an external law firm to review all of the website content. Yes. That law firm was Allens. Yes. And you told us that Allianz disabled the travel insurance pages of the website on the 6th of June and the purchase path on the 12th of June. 
Yes. Was that the result of a recommendation by Allens? No. Why was that? Why did you do that? those things on those two dates? The pulling the website down. Mm. Um, I made that decision based on the length of time and our failure to act. You made that decision, Mr Winter? Yes. Based on the length of time and the failure to act? Yes. Now, um, there were a number of meetings between Allianz, AWP and Allens to discuss the issues about the website, weren't there? Yes. And in the course of those meetings, Allens raised concerns about whether there could also be incorrect or misleading statements on the websites of your partners, Allianz's partner websites. Yes. You, you gave evidence earlier that partners could be airlines, travel sites, financial institution websites. Is that right? Yes. Now, that was discussed at a meeting on the 14th of June this year. Yes. Uh, we've got the minutes of that meeting. If we go to ALZ 0001 Now, on the first page there, we can see that there were representatives of Allianz, AWP and Allens at this meeting. Yes. And we can see that the minutes record that AWP at this point had 76 partners, 36 managed by Allianz and 40 managed by AWP. Yes. Does that accord with your understanding? Yes. And underneath that, we see that partner landing pages are managed by the individual partners. Yes. But the partner purchase paths are managed by AWP. Yes. And if we go further into the document at 0031, we can see the minutes for two agenda items, the first being discuss and agree quick fix for purchase path and discuss what is required to be actioned for partners. Yes. Do you see that? You see in the main column the reference to discuss the need to determine the necessary wording changes that are required to get the purchase path back online as quickly as possible. Yes. So now that the purchase path was offline, it was important to fix things quickly. Yes. Because every day that the purchase path was offline, Allianz and AWP lost money. Yes. So where was that sense of urgency when the purchase path was still online? It wasn't there. And underneath the part that I've just read to you, we see CS outlined AWP plan to devote dedicated resources to reviewing and remediating partner purchase paths and partner landing pages. Partner landing pages may or may not contain misleading and deceptive content as this content is produced by each individual partner. Identified issues on the purchase path are likely to appear across most, if not all, partner purchase paths as the content is supplied by AWP. AWP will be guided by Allen's review of Alliance Direct when reviewing partner content. The AWP review of partner purchase paths and landing pages will be distributed to RV and LD, who will provide to Allen's. KH stated that the notification letter of the breach was confined to the issues concerning the content on the Alliance website. The notification did not deal with any other websites or pages which have the similar content that needs rectification. It will be necessary to update ASIC on this matter when the facts are ascertained. KH stated that ASIC will ask when Allianz knew about other websites being affected and what steps it took when Allianz to limit consumer harm. There was discussion about the need to advise Allianz partners that there is potentially misleading content, how long it is going to take to fix it and what to do in the meantime. This may involve taking down the purchase path until rectified. It was agreed to determine the scope of changes on Friday, how long it will take and how many sites are affected. 
Allianz will then determine what steps it needs to be taken in respect of the financial institution partners it manages, and AWP will do likewise. Uh, so at this meeting on the 14th of June this year, Allianz determined that it was likely that the incorrect, misleading and deceptive content that affected its purchase path would also affect the purchase paths for its partners? Yes. All 76 of them? Most likely, yes. And Allianz was aware that it hadn't disclosed this to ASIC? Not at that stage, no. And it hadn't disclosed it to its partners? No. So at this stage, the direct purchase path had been taken down, but the partner purchase paths were still up? Yes. Uh, now, I'll tender those minutes, Commissioner. Minutes of meeting uh, concerning travel insurance web pages, 14 June 18, ALZ 000101 0021 0028, uh, Exhibit 2.275. There was another meeting between Allens, AWP and Allianz on the 15th of June. Yes. And one of the actions arising from that meeting was for AWP to provide a timeline for its reviews of the partner websites. Is that right? Uh, yes. And that day, Mr Dalzell, the CEO of AWP, sent you an email? Yes. We'll go to that. AZW 0001 3098. Can you give me the number again? AZW 0001 0003098. Now we see the email at the bottom of 3098 and over on to 3099. And in the final paragraph of that email, Mr Dalzell said to you, my team will provide a work plan next Monday. Now they have all the changes required, covering both the Allianz website and all other sites in production. The issue, of course, is the speed of this fix. We will have exact details Monday, but I remain of the view that we will be able to effect the required changes quicker than we will be able to bring down the websites with less impact. I would ask that we reconvene with this information to decide what the next course of action is. I am on the record about my views on this topic, so I don't take this as circumventing the need for strict compliance. It's not. I believe we don't have the information to make a decision until Monday about what to do next. So we see there that Mr Dalzell was expressing the view that it would be better to leave the partner websites online. Yes. Even though Allianz and AWP knew that they most likely contained incorrect, misleading and deceptive content. Yes. He thought that fixing the content would have less impact than taking down the websites. Provided we honoured the representations made, yes. Less impact on what, Mr Winter? The time taken to... I think he was... Um, Pointing to the time we engaged with various partners, had them pull their website down, in the meantime they could be rectified. He wasn't and couldn't have been talking about less impact on your customers, could he? No. Um, he meant less impact on the bottom line, didn't he? Yes. He said, I don't take this as circumventing the need for strict compliance, but it was, wasn't it? Yes. There was misleading information in the different purchase paths and he wanted to leave them online. Yes. And if we turn back to the first page, we can see that you responded to this email later that day. You said, subject to resolving the point raised below and having visibility of the plan and time required to fix the partner sites, I support keeping them in place rather than shutting them down. That was your decision, Mr Winter? Yes. Were the partner sites shut down? No. Why not? In between those emails, I took advice um, 
and we made a decision based on the fact that we were going to honour the representations and rectify the sites in a short period of time. You were aware that the partner sites contained misleading and deceptive information? Yes. Uh, and you made the decision not to take them down? Yes. I'll tender that email chain, Commissioner. Emails to and from Delcells, 15 June 18, AZW 0001 0010-3098, Exhibit 6.276. Now, during that time, Alliance continued to investigate when the misleading content first appeared on the website? Yes. And if we go to AZW 0001 0087, we see an email from Kathleen Harris, the Executive Legal Counsel for Allianz, to Gavin Burns, the General Counsel for AWP. You see that email, Mr Winter? Yes. And now in the second main paragraph of the email, Ms Harris said, Richard tells me that the following information is outstanding as at today. And in paragraph B, she says, the date as to when the misleading content went on the AWP controlled P1 purchase path. We have reason to believe there was misleading material prior to 2015, and we are currently in the process of reconstructing the website at particular times. You see that? Yes. So by the 21st of June, there was reason to believe that there may have been misleading material on the website prior to 2015. Yes. Now, um, I tender that email chain, Commissioner. Emails between Harris Burns and others, uh, AZW 0001 0087, Exhibit 6.277. Now, could I ask that you be shown ALZ triple... I should, sorry, the, there should be a date uh, of those emails. 21 June uh, 18. Could I ask that you be shown ALZ triple zero one zero zero eight two five seven zero four. The number again in case that assists. It's ALZ 0001 0082 5704. This is a document provided by Alliance under a notice to produce issued by the Commission, provided to the Commission today. It's a short email, so what I'll do while it's coming up is read it to you and see yep. if you're able to answer my questions based on that while it's coming up, um, Mr Winter. It's an email from Michael Taig, T-A-I-G, to Kathleen Harris, who we saw in the previous mm -hmm. email, um, entitled, Forward, Alliance Travel Pages, July 2012, Doc. So the subject line is... Um, the name of a document which is annexed to the email, Alliance Travel Pages, July 2012. And the email says, Kathleen, based on investigations to date using Wayback and DCSO records, we had defective information about Alliance Travel Product 
on the landing pages from day one in July 2012. Based on DCSO record but not verifiable at this stage, the purchase path was also defective. The email goes on to say, the detailed reconstruct will be undertaken with the following to be documented. I will be meeting with a group at 1pm to confirm the parcel of work required to complete the full chronology of the defect. We will update you at the team meeting, meeting today. Now, Mr Taig was um, an Executive General Manager at Allianz. Uh, he was until the end of last year and he's come back to assist with the Royal Commission preparation. I see. So his email records that on the 21st of June, which is the same date as the previous email I took you to, mm -hmm. on the 21st of June, Allianz knew that the defective information about the travel insurance products had been on the landing pages from day one in July 2012. Do you understand that? I do, yes. Have you seen that email before? Uh, no, I haven't. But do you accept that Allianz knew from the 21st of June this year that the defective travel insurance information had been online since July 2012? Yes. Now, I will tender that document when we're able to bring it up, Commissioner. Well, the email tag to Harris entitled Forward uh, Allianz Travel Pages July 2012 dot doc ALZ 0001008257045704, which now appears. Thank you. I'll just uh, give you a moment. Exhibit 6.278. I'll just give you a moment to read through that email, Mr. Winter. Yes, it's as, as we discussed. Yes. Now, we mentioned earlier that the deadline that ASIC gave Allianz to respond to its request for more information was the 20th of July. You recall that? Yes. Now, in the lead up to that deadline, which is after this email on the screen, there was another meeting between Allianz AWP and Allens. Yes. And if we go to AZW 0001001234, we see the minutes for that meeting. Can I um, ask you firstly, you agree that these are minutes of the meeting on the 17th of July 2018 between Allens, AWP and Allianz? Yes. You weren't present at this meeting? No. But you've reviewed this document in preparing to give evidence today? I can't be certain. I'm sure I've, I've looked at it, yes. Well, could I ask you to look at one, two, three, five? In item four of the minutes, we see ASIC response. Do you see that? Subsequent to this meeting in the remediation process, an ASIC response is required by Friday 20 July. Yes. And then letter has been drafted by AAIL as consideration to provide non-specific response via joint AWP-AAIL statement. AAIL is Allianz? Yes. So the plan was to send ASIC a non-specific response in, to its request for information? That's what the minute says. I'm not certain what they mean by that. Okay. What is meant by that? I'll tender those minutes, Commissioner. Minutes of meeting concerning Allianz Direct Travel Claims Remediation Plan, 17 July 18, AZW 0001 0001 Three, four, exhibit 6.279. And could I ask that you look at AZW 0001-0016-0761. We see that the day after the meeting, the minutes of which I've just taken you to, 
Lauren DeCamp, a corporate solicitor for Allianz, you'll see this in a minute, Mr Winter, sent an email to Matthew Clayton, copied to a few other people at Allianz, including Kathleen Harris. You see that? Yes. And Mr Camp said in the first paragraph, we believe that it is important for the regulator to know when Allianz first became aware of an issue with website content. The Minter Ellison review in quarter three, 2015, notes issues with the proposed website content, in particular around the use of the word unlimited. So Minter Ellison had reviewed the proposed new website content in the third quarter of 2015 and identified issues around the use of the word unlimited. Yes. So that was before the December 2015 update to the website. Yes. But the proposed new content was uploaded anyway. Yes. Using the word unlimited, despite the concerns expressed by Minters. Based on um, investigations I've completed, it looks like there were subsequent discussions between um, Minters and the internal lawyer. Um, it didn't change the advice from Minters, but I think it was incorrectly approved by uh, the internal lawyer following those discussions. I see. I'll tender that email, Commissioner. Internal Alliance email of 18 July uh, 2018 concerning travel insurance uh, content, AZW 0001 0016-0761, exhibit 6.280. Commissioner, I see that um, it's just after quarter past. I think I could finish um, with Mr Winter by about half past. It's a matter for you, Commissioner, as to whether well, you're comfortable with that. It's a matter for Mr Winter. What would you prefer to do, Mr Winter? Finish? I can stay all night if we hour. need to. I would like to get it finished, please. You astonish me. <laughs> Go on, Ms Hall. Now, I want to come to the letter that Allianz sent to ASIC in response to the request for further information. You recall that the request for further information was due on the 20th of July? Yes. Um, did Allianz send a response by the 20th of July? I don't know the date off the top of my head, sorry. All right, let's look at um, exhibit 20 to your statement. Um, ALZ 0000719701. This is the letter that went to ASIC. We see that it's dated the 20th of July 2018. Yes. But it, um, it appears that it was sent on the 23rd of July 2018. Does that sound right to you? I'm not aware that that delay occurred. I All had right. it anticipated. Well, it let's leave that 20th. to one side for now. We see it's dated the 20th, yeah. 20th of July 2018. And if we turn to, perhaps if we could have both pages on the screen, we see on the second page that it was a letter signed by you. Yes. And on the first page, you said, we confirm that the investigation is still ongoing? Yes. And over the page, you provided some further detail? Yes. Under continuing investigation, you said, Alliance is currently in the process of investigating the number and monetary value of potentially disadvantaged customers whose claims were previously settled the length of time in which the potentially misleading content was live on the Allianz Direct web pages and the content of any training materials that may be used by various partners to affect sale of travel insurance. Do you see that? Yes. And in your previous letter to ASIC with Ms Callaghan, you'd said that the incorrect travel insurance content had been on the website since around December 2015. Yes. But by the time of this letter, Allianz knew that it had been on the website for a much longer period. It knew that it had been on the website since day one in July 2012. Yes, based on the memo you produced from Michael Tague. 
So why didn't Allianz tell ASIC that it believed that there had been incorrect, misleading and deceptive material on the website before the date it had previously given of December 2015 and right back to July 2012? I can't be certain. Had I known of the uh, Michael's investigation, I would have had a different date. So do you say you were unaware when you sent this letter that the misleading and deceptive content had been on the website since July 2012? Um, yes. You were unaware? I was not aware. But others in your organisation knew that the material had been on the website since July 2012? I would expect so, yes. And you, as the person representing Allianz in its dealings with ASIC, didn't inform yourself um, of that material that was known to others in your organisation? Yes. On the 30th of August, ASIC asked for another update from Allianz by the 7th of September, is that right? Yes. And then on the day after that, ASIC sent Allianz a notice under section 912C of the Corporations Act. Yes. And that notice required Allianz to produce information about the misleading statements on the website and the purchase path. Yes. Including information about the periods in which those statements were on the website and purchase path. Yes. And Allianz responded to that notice 10 days ago on the 7th of September. Yes. Could I ask that you look at ALZ 0001 0153 Now, part of the response was this letter, a letter from you. Yes. Um, and if we turn to 0022, we see that you told ASIC that the partner websites contained potentially incorrect or potentially misleading statements in relation to travel insurance products underwritten by Allianz, including statements similar to those originally identified in Allianz's letter to ASIC of 12 June. Yes. When did Allianz work out that this issue um, definitely affected the partner websites? Uh, quite quickly, quite soon after um, we reviewed our own uh, website and it became apparent that the content was still there, we looked at partner websites and it was pretty obvious that it was there as well. So are you talking about back in May 2018? I'd say by the middle of June we had by the middle of completed June, those, that investigation. Before or after your letter to ASIC dated the 20th of June? I'm sorry, the 20th of July. Oh, sorry, I've put that in a confusing way. You had a letter to ASIC on the 12th of June and a letter to ASIC on the 20th of July. Mm -hmm. Did you know that the issue definitely affected the partner websites before your letter of the 12th of June? No. Did you know before your letter dated the 20th of July? I can't be certain. I don't think so, otherwise I would have put it in the letter. But you just told me that you thought you learnt that in the middle of June. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got the dates confused. You think that that was later? Yes. Now, further down in the letter, you told ASIC that the population of customers who purchased insurance through the Allianz Direct Purchase Pathway was only about 10% of the total sales of travel insurance made by Allianz and AWP? Yes. So does that mean that the potential number of affected customers could be 10 times higher than those identified by Allianz? Um, in the 912C notice to ASIC, I think we identified as um, over 2 million policies sold during that period. Um, it's, a, it's a longer period of time. Um, those affected would be a subset of of that, but at the moment we haven't actually narrowed down to an exact uh, number of impacted customers. All right. Could I tender the letter to ASIC dated at the 7th of September 2018? 
Met her alliance to ASIC 7, September 18, uh, ALZ 0001, 0153, 0021, Exhibit 6.281. Uh, now, the other part of that response was a written statement responding to the matters in the 912C notice. That's ALZ 0001, 0153, 0024. Uh, and if we go to 0026, we see that this statement included a table setting out the 39 incorrect or misleading statements about travel insurance policies. Yes. And the dates on which those statements were first identified. If you buy identified, you mean when they were actually on the website, yes. I'm sorry, the period in which the statement was made is the heading of the column. Yes. So the date, um, the date uh, that the statement commenced being made on the website. Is yes. that right? Yes. Now, so we see from this that 10 days ago, on the 7th of September, Alliance told ASIC that many of the incorrect, misleading and deceptive statements had been on the website since 2012. Yes. But this was known within Alliance since the 21st of June. Yes. And it was only in response to a compulsory notice from ASIC that this information was provided. Yes. And if we turn to 0035, we see that the response to ASIC in this statement also included another table in response to ASIC's question about the remedial action that uh, Alliance was taking. Yes. And the first remedial action referred to is the removal of the travel section of the website and purchase path from public view. Yes. And in the third column, um, we see that the purchase path was disabled on the 24th of August. Yes. But you told the Commission in your statement that the purchase path was disabled on the 12th of June. I think 24th of August captures both those points. So the purchase path was taken down earlier. And the second point there, which is instructed AWP to cease all digital marketing, um, we were only certain that that was in place by uh, the 24th of August. I see. So we could state that clearly, separate the two points. The first one definitely by um, the 12th. The and earlier the date, sorry. The yes. second one by the 24th of August? Yes. And at item five in this table, which is 0037, the table records that Alliance has undertaken investigations into the length of time in which the potentially incorrect or misleading content was live on the Alliance Direct web pages. You see that? Yes. But you didn't tell ASIC here when that investigation had been completed and Alliance ascertained that the misleading statements, many of them, had been on the website since 2012? No. Those investigations were completed on the 21st of June when we saw the email within Alliance, weren't they? Yes. And on Page 0041, you responded to ASIC's question about the number of policies issued between the 1st of December 2015 and the 6th of June 2018. Do you see that in paragraph 12? Yes. Um, you told Alliance here that more than 2 million travel insurance policies were issued by Alliance and AWP during that period. Oh, in ASIC, I think. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how I put that, Commissioner. I, I wanted to say that you I told ASIC... I knew you were ASIC, talking about ASIC, yes. You told ASIC that more than 2 million travel insurance policies were issued by Alliance and AWP during that period, including about 280,000 through the Alliance Direct pathway. Yes. Um, 
Now, that's just in the period from 1 December 2015 to the 6th of June 2018. Yes. Not the whole period that the misleading and deceptive information was on the website? No. Now, in your statement to the Commission, you said that only 605,585 policies had been sold during the whole period when the incorrect or misleading information was on the website. Do you recall that? Yes, however, that 605 related to um, direct online policies and responded directly to the rubric, whereas this captures all um, travel policies issued by AWP during the period in question. The question that you were asked in the rubric, Mr Winter, um, was for each type of policy affected by affected by the potentially incorrect or misleading content relating to a range of insurance products, including travel insurance, identify the number of policies sold during the period when the potentially incorrect or misleading content was on the Allianz website. Yes. And the answer that you gave was 605,585 policies. Yes. That was 1.4 million fewer than the total number of policies that you told ASIC were sold between December 2015 and June 2018. Yes, if you go, um, if I could clarify that. Yes, Because I please. asked the same question myself. I've relied on Craig Dalzell for these, for the the data here. In um, 53 of my witness statement, yes. um, as I understand it, the direct... Uh, Perhaps if we could bring this up to assist ALZ 0001 0092 0007. 0001 at 0007. Mm -hmm. Go on, Mr Winter. Yeah, so... Um, at the time, if we were going for the period from um, December uh, 2015 through to um, the end of June, as per this rubric, we, um, my understanding is the data was related to the direct channel as it's set out in item number 53 of my statement. But Mr Winter, the rubric um, didn't confine you to December 2015 to June 2018. It asked for the number of policies sold during the period when the potentially incorrect or misleading content was on the website. We see that from 0023 in this document. Yes. So is the figure recorded in your witness statement of 605,585 policies that we see at the bottom of the right-hand page of the screen incorrect? I had personally verified that number and, sorry, inquired as to that number and made to make sure it was correct based on um, looking at the most recently reported data. I am happy to say, I'm not happy to, I'm, I can acknowledge that it's not correct. It's not correct. What should that figure be? I would rely on the latest um, data uh, reported to ASIC. It's in excess of two million travel insurance policies that were sold during the period when the potentially incorrect or misleading content was on the website. Yes. That's another change we should read into your statement, Mr Winter? Yes. I have no further questions for the witness, Commissioner. Mr Lockhart, before you begin, there's a matter that I should perhaps raise with both Council. As things stand uh, at the moment, it may later be said <coughs> that there is some tension between what is said in paragraph 92 of Mr Winter's statement as affirmed by him at the outset of his evidence, 
what he later said about the nature and origins of the document, which is tab 11 in exhibit MW02, which is document ALZ 0010067257. It is a matter entirely for you to determine whether it is necessary or desirable to take up any aspect of those matters with him. So I do not want you to be under any misunderstanding that on the face of it, at least at the moment, it is possible that there may be some tension now, if you wish to consider that overnight, of course you should. And simply tell me and you may have that time. If you wish to announce now the course you will take, do. But uh, uh, it's a matter entirely for you, Mr Lockhart. We'll consider that over overnight, Commissioner. Then should Mr Winter uh, remain in Melbourne uh, overnight? Yes, I think he should, Commissioner. Yes, very well. What time tomorrow morning? Oh, I think it would be prudent if we started at 9.30, Commissioner. Thank you. If you, you might say that. Oh, 9.30 tomorrow morning then. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, Mr Winter wishes to clarify his evidence concerning the origins of the document behind tab 11 of the exhibit to his 24 August statement. He's reviewed overnight some documents and he signed a short witness statement which exhibits those documents. Yes. And that we, through that means, he seeks to demonstrate that the tab 11 document was created on the date of the Arico meeting in May 2016 and not by lawyers assisting for the purposes of the giving of evidence in the Royal Commission, and nor is there an extract from other documents. Um, in the short statement he has signed, he identifies the errors he made in the giving of his evidence yesterday. What I'd like to do is, um, if Mr Winter can go back into the witness box, yes. and I'll show him his statement and proceed from there if that's yes. suitable Winter, to come back, the Commission. Um, Mr Winter, you recall you were asked some questions yesterday about the origin of the document behind tab 11 of the exhibit to your 24 August statement. Yes. And you gave some evidence yesterday that it was not contemporaneous with the 2016, uh, May 2016 a RICO meeting, but was created by lawyers as part of preparation for your giving of evidence. Yes. And you also gave some evidence that you understood that it might have represented an extract from certain other documents. Do you recall giving that evidence? Yes, I do. Have you had a chance overnight to review some further documents and reflect on the origins of the document behind tab 11 uh, in the exhibit to your statement? Yes. And have you made a further statement seeking to correct the evidence that you gave yesterday about those matters? Yes. Um, Mr Winter, do you have um, that that statement with you, that being a statement dated 17 September 18? Yes. Um, are the contents of that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, I tender that statement and the exhibit accompanying the statement. It the contains... statement of Mr Winter dated 17 September 18 and its exhibits mm. becomes exhibit six point uh, I'm not sure whether we're up to 282 or 283. Two. 6.282. The witness, the document number is WIT 001.0168.0001. Yes, thank you. Those are any further questions I have for Mr Winter? Yes, and no re-examination otherwise, Mr No re-examination otherwise. Yes, thank you. Nothing further, yes. Commissioner. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. Winter. You may step down.